Section 14 of 20 Short Science Fiction Stories by Various Authors. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Helpful Hand of God by Tom Godwin. God can be very helpful indeed, but of course it's long been known that God helps those who wisely help themselves. From Vulgarian Revised Encyclopedia. Saints. Golden Saints, properly Yellow Saints, a term of contempt applied by the Vulgarian State Press to members of the Church of the Golden Rule because of their opposition to the war then being planned against Alcoria. See Churches. Church, Golden Rule, of the A group of reactionary fanatics who resisted state control and advocated social chaos through individual freedom. They were liquidated in the unity purge but for two thousand of the more able-bodied, who were sentenced to the moon mines of Bell and Nine. The prison ship never arrived there, and it is assumed that the condemned saints somehow overpowered the guards and escaped to some remote section of the galaxy. Kane had observed Commander Yanor's bird-of-prey profile with detached interest as Yanor jerked his head around to glare again at the chronometer on the farther wall of the cruiser's command room. "'What's keepin' Daling?' Yanor demanded, transferring his glare to Kane. "'Did you assure him that I have all day to waste?' "'He should be here any minute, sir,' Kane answered." I didn't find the saints, after others had failed for sixty years, then to sit and wait. The situation on Bogar was already very critical when we left. Yanor scowled at the chronometer again. Every hour we waste waiting here will delay our return to Vogar by an hour. I presume you realize that. It does sound like logical theory, Kane agreed. Yanor's face darkened dangerously. You will. Quick, hard-heeled footsteps sounded in the corridor outside. The guard officer, Dalen, stepped through the doorway and saluted, his eyes like ice under his pale brows and his uniform seeming to bristle with weapons. "'The native is here, sir,' he said to Yanor. He turned and made a commanding gesture. The leader of the saints appeared, the man whose resistance Yanor would have to break. A frail, white-bearded old man scuffled uncertainly into the room in straw sandals, his faded blue eyes peering nearsightedly toward Yanor. "'Go to the commander's desk,' Dalen ordered in his metallic tones. The old man obeyed and stopped before Yanor's desk, his hands clasped together as though to hide their trembling. "'You are Bren,' Yanor said, "'and you hold, I believe, the impressive titles of Chief Executive of the Council of Provinces and Supreme Elder of the Churches of the Golden Rule?' "'Yes, sir.' There was a faint quaver in old Bren's voice. I welcome you to our world, sir, and offer you our friendship. I understand you can produce Elysium X fuel. Yes, sir. Our Dr. LaRue told me the process is within our ability. We, he hesitated. We know you haven't enough fuel to return to Volgar. Yanor stiffened in his chair. What makes you think that? It requires a great deal of fuel to get through the Whirlpool star cluster, and even sixty years ago, the Elysium ores of Bogar were almost exhausted. Yanor smiled thinly. That reminds me, you would be one of the saints who murdered their guards and stole a ship to get here. We killed no guards, sir. In fact, all of them eventually joined our church. We had to cut it up for our start in mechanization. I presume you know you will pay for it. It was taking us to our deaths in the radium mines, but we will pay whatever you ask. The first installment will be 1,000 units of fuel, to be produced with the greatest speed possible. Yes, sir, but in return. The old man stood a little straighter, and an underlying resolve was suddenly revealed. You must recognize us as a free race. Free? A colony founded by escaped criminals? That's not true. We committed no crime, harming no living thing. The hard, cold words of Yanor cut off his protest. This world is now a Vulgarian possession. Every man, woman, and child upon it is a prisoner of the Vulgarian state. There will be no resistance. 
this cruiser's disintegrators can destroy a town within seconds your race within hours do you understand what i mean the visible portion of old bren's face turned pale he spoke at last in the bitter tones of frightened stubborn determination i offered you our friendship i hope you would accept for we are a peaceful race i should have known that you came only to persecute and enslave us but the hand of god will reach down and help us and yenor laughed a raucous sound like the harsh caw of the vulgarian vulture and held up a hairy fist this old man is the hand for you to center your prayers around i want full-scale fuel production commenced within twenty-four hours if this is done and if you continue to unquestioningly obey all my commands i will for that long defer your punishment as an escaped criminal if it is not done i will destroy a town exactly twenty-five hours from now and as many more as may be necessary and you will be publicly executed as a condemned criminal and an enemy of the vulgarian state yenor turned to dallin take him away scared sheep yenor said when bren was gone Tomorrow he'll say that he prayed and his God told him what to do, which will be to save his neck by doing as I command. I don't know, Kane said doubtfully. I think you're wrong about his conscience folding so easily. You think? Yenor asked. Perhaps I should remind you that the ability to think is usually characteristic of commanders rather than sub-ensigns. You will not be asked to try to think beyond the small extent required to comprehend simple commands. Kane sighed with weary resignation. An unexpected encounter with an Alcorian battleship had sent the Vulgarian cruiser fleeing through the unexplored Whirlpool star cluster. Yenor and Kane, the two surviving commissioned officers, with results of negative value to those most affected, the world of the saint had been accidentally discovered, and he, Kane, had risen from sub-ensign to the shakily temporary position of second-in-command. Yenor spoke again. Since Vulgarian commanders do not go out and mingle with the natives of the subject world, you will act as my representative. I'll let Bren sweat until tomorrow, then you will go see him. In that, and in all subsequent contacts with the natives, you will keep in mind the fact that I shall hold you personally responsible for any failure of my program. The next afternoon, two hours before the deadline, Kane went out into the sweet spring air of the world the saints had named Sanctuary. It was a virgin world, rich in resources needed by Vogar, with 20,000 saints as the primary labor supply. It was also, he thought, a green and beautiful world, almost a familiar world. The cruiser stood at the upper edge of the town, and in the late afternoon, soon the little white and brown houses were touched with gold, half hidden in deep azure shadows of the tall trees and flowering vines that bordered the gently curving streets. Restlessness stirred within him as he looked at them. It was like going back in time to the Lost Islands, that isolated little region of Vogar that had eluded collectivization until the year he was sixteen. It had been at the same time of year, in the spring, that the state unity forces had landed. The lost island villages had been drowsing in the sun that afternoon, as this town was drowsing now. He forced the memories from his mind, and the futile restlessness they brought, and went on past a golden-spired church to a small cottage that was almost hidden in a garden of flowers and giant silver ferns. Bren met him at the door, his manner very courteous, his eyes dark-shadowed with weariness as though he had not slept for many hours, and invited him inside. When they were seated in the simply furnished room, Bren said, "'You came for my decision, sir.' "'The commander sent me for it.' Bren folded his thin hands, which seemed to have the trembling sometimes characteristic of the aged. Yesterday evening, when I came from the ship, I prayed for guidance, and I saw that I could only abide by the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Which means, Cain asked, that you will do what? 
should we of the church be stranded upon an alien world our fuel supply almost gone we would ask for help by our golden rule we can do no less than give it eighteen hours ago i issued the order for full-scale all-out fuel production i've been up all night and day checking the operation kane stared surprised that yanor should have so correctly predicted bren's reaction he tried to see some change in the old man some evidence of the personal fear that must have broken him so quickly but there was only weariness and a gentleness so much fuel brennan said is vogar still at war with alcoria kane nodded once i saw some alcorian prisoners of war on vogar brennan said they are a peaceful dog-like race they never wanted to go to war with vogar well they still didn't want war but on alcoria were elusium ores and other resources that the vulgarian state had to have before it could carry out its long frustrated ambition of galactic conquest i'll go now kane said getting out of his chair and see what you're having done the commander doesn't take anybody's word for anything bren called a turbo car and driver to take him to the multi-purpose factory which was located a short distance beyond the other side of town. The driver stopped before the factory's main office, where a plump, bald man was waiting, his scalp and glasses gleaming in the sunshine. "'I'm Dr. LaRue, sir,' he greeted Kane. He had a face that under normal circumstance would have been genial. "'Father Bren said you were coming. I am at your service, to show you what we're doing.' They went inside the factory, where the rush of activity was like a beehive. Machines and installations not needed for fuel production were being torn out as quickly as possible, others taking their place. The workers, he craned his neck to verify his astonished first impression. All of them were women. Father Brent's suggestion, LaRue said. These girls are as competent as men for this kind of work, and their use here permits the release of men to the outer provinces to procure the raw materials. As you know, our population is small and widely scattered. A crash sounded as a huge object nearby toppled and fell. Kane took an instinctive backward step and bumped into something soft. Oh, excuse me, sir. He turned and had a confused vision of an apologetic smile in a pretty young face of red curls knocked into disarray and of amazingly short shorts and a tantalizing wispy halter she recovered the notebook she had dropped and hurried on leaving a faint cloud of perfume in her wake and a disturbing memory of curving golden tan legs and a flat little stomach that had been exposed both north and south to the extreme limits of modesty a personal supervisor from Beachville, LaRue said. She was sunbathing when the plane arrived to pick her up and had no time to obtain her clothing. Father Bren firmly insisted upon not losing one minute of time during this emergency. A crane rumbled into view and its grapple seized the huge object that had fallen. Our central air conditioning unit, LaRue said, it had to go. You're putting something else in its place, of course. Oh, yes, we must have more space, but Father Bren opposed the plan of building an annex as too dangerously time-consuming. The only alternative is to tear out everything not absolutely essential. Kane left shortly afterward, satisfied that the saints were doing as Bren had said. He went back out in the spring sunshine where the turbo car was still waiting for him, debated briefly with himself, and dismissed the driver. After so many weeks in the prison-like ship, it would be pleasant to walk again. A grassy, tree-covered ridge ran like the swell of a green sea between the plant and the town. He stopped on top of it, where the town was almost hidden from view, and looked out across the white valley. Shadows moved lazily across it as cotton-puff clouds drifted down the blue dome of the sky. Great white birds like swans were soaring overhead calling to one another in voices like the singing of violins, bringing again the memories of the lost islands. And the Bulgarian lord gazed upon his world and found it good. He swung around, 
his hand dropping to his holstered blaster, and looked into the green, mocking eyes of a tawny-haired girl. She was beautiful, in the savage way that the hill leopards of Vogar were beautiful, and her hand was on a pistol in her belt. Her eyes flickered from his blaster up to his face, bright with challenge. "'Want to try it?' she asked. She wore a short skirt with some rough material, and her knees were dusty, as though she had walked for a long way. These things he noticed only absently, his eyes going back to the bold, beautiful face. For twenty years he had been accustomed to the women of Vogar, colorless in their party uniforms and men's haircuts, made even more drab by the masculine mannerisms they affected. Not since the spring the lost island died had he seen a girl like this one before him. Well, she asked, do you think you'll know me next time? He walked to her, while she watched him with cat-like wariness. Hand me that pistol, he ordered. Try to take it, you vulgarian ape. He moved, and a moment later she was sitting on the ground, her eyes wide with dismayed surprise as he shoved the pistol in his own belt. "'Resisting a Bulgarian with a deadly weapon calls for the death penalty,' he said. "'I suppose you know what I can do?' She got up, defiance like a blaze about her. "'I'll tell you what you can do. You can go to hell.' The thought came to him that there might be considerable pleasure in laying her over his knee and raising some blisters where they would do her the most good. He regretfully dismissed the idea as too undignified for even a sub-ensign and asked, "'Who are you, and what are you doing here with that pistol?' She hesitated, then answered with insolent coolness, "'My name is Barbara Loring. I heard that you Vulgarians had demanded that we agree to surrender. I came down from the hills to disagree. Is a resistance force meeting here? Do you think you could make me tell you?' There are ways, but I'm not here to use them. I am not your enemy. A little of the hostility faded from her face, and she asked, How could a Vulgarian ever not be our enemy? He could find no satisfactory answer to the question. I can tell you this, she said. I know of no resistance organization. I can also tell you that we are not the race of cowards you think, and will fight the instant Father Bren gives the word. For one who speaks respectfully of Bren, he said, your recent words and actions weren't very religious and refined. Fire flashed in the green eyes again. Up in the Azure Mountains, where I come from, we're not very refined, and we like being that way. And why do you carry guns? he asked. Because all along our frontier lines are rhino stags, cliff bears, thunderhawks, and a lot of other overgrown carnivora that don't like us, that's why. I see. He took the pistol from his belt and held it out to her. Go back to your mountains where you belong, before you do something to get yourself executed. Yenor waiting impatiently in the ship was grimly pleased by the news of Bren's change of attitude. Exactly what I predicted, as you no doubt recall. How long until they can have a thousand units of fuel produced? LaRue estimated fourteen days at best. Yenor tapped his thick fingers on the desk, scowling thoughtfully. As little as seven extra days might force Vogar to accept the Alcorian peace terms because of lack of fuel. The natives can work twice as hard as they expected to. Tell old Bren they will be given exactly seven days from sunrise tomorrow. And summon Dalen and Graver. I want them to make use of every man on the ship for a 24-hour guard and inspection system in the plant. The natives will get no opportunities for stalling or sabotage. Brennan was writing at his book-laden table when Kane went into his cottage the next morning. These are called edicts, Bren said after greeting him, but I possess no law-making powers and they are really only suggestions. Bren shoved the paper to one side. The script was somewhat different from that of Vogar. The Vogarian inspection and guard system is no more than an expected precaution against sabotage. The Vulgarians must be regarded as potential friends who now treat us with suspicion and arrogance, only because they do not yet realize the sincerity of our desire to help them to any extent short of surrender. 
Cain looked up from the uncompleted, surprisingly humble edict, and Brennan asked, "'Your commander, sir. He is now pleased with our actions?' "'Not exactly. He will disintegrate a town seven days from sunrise this morning if all the fuel isn't produced by then.' Seven, Only seven days?' There was a startled disbelief on Brennan's face. "'But how can he expect us to produce so much fuel in so short a time?' "'I don't know.' I'm sorry. It's something I would have argued against if I hadn't had too much sense to try. Seven days, Bren said again. We can only pray that God will let it be time enough. Cain walked on to the plant. The hilltop where he had met the girl was deserted, and he felt a vague disappointment. The plant was hot without the air conditioner, especially in the vicinity of the electronic roasters. The girls looked flushed and uncomfortable, but for the red head who still wore her scanty sunsuit. The armed vulgarians looked incongruously out of place among the girls and were sweating profusely. Kane made a mental note to have them ordered into tropical uniforms. He found Dalen prowling like a wolf among his guards. It's inconceivable that these women could ever be a menace, Dalen said, but I'm taking no chances. He saw Graver the cruiser's chief technician, a thin, dry man who seemed to be as emotionless as the machines and electronic circuits that were his life. They're doing everything with astonishing competence, Graver said. My technicians are watching like hawks, though. LaRue was not in his office. His secretary, a brown-eyed woman of strikingly intelligent appearance, said, I'm sorry, sir. Dr. LaRue had to go back to town for a few minutes. "'May I give him your message?' "'No, thanks,' he said. "'Father Bren is probably performing that unpleasant chore right now.' Since Dalen and Graver seemed to have the situation at the plant well in hand, Kane decided to make a tour of the outer provinces where the ores were being mined. An efficient plant would be worthless if it did not receive sufficient ore. He spent four days on the inspection tour, much longer than he had expected to be gone, but made necessary by the fact that the small Elysium mines were widely scattered in rugged, roadless areas and he had to walk most of the distance. The single helicopter on Sanctuary was being used to fly the ore out, but it was operating on a schedule that caused him to miss it each time. Each mine was being worked by full day and night crews, in fact, by more men than necessary, the reason for that, and for the way the men silently withheld their hostility, was made apparent in a bit of conversation between two miners that he overheard one day. So why all of us here when not this many are needed? They say Father Bren wanted to get all the men out of town, away from the cruiser, so there would be no trouble, and you know there would have been if we had stayed. He wants to get the cruiser on its way back to Vogar, they say so we can get busy producing weapons to fight the occupation force. He returned on the fifth evening of the allotted seven days and stopped by Bren's cottage before going on to the ship. The old man was working in his garden, his trembling hands trying to tie up a red-flowered vine. Cain tied it for him, and he said, Thank you, sir. Did you find the mining to be as I had said? I found more than that. You know, don't you? that Yenora will return with the occupation force a hundred days after leaving here. Yes, I know that is his intention. I understand that you're going to try to build weapons while he's gone. Don't, if you think anything of your people, let them do it. Nothing you could build in a hundred days would last a minute against a cruiser's disintegrators. I know, Bren said. We are supposed to choose between bloody, hopeless resistance and eternal slavery, aren't we? But why should either fate befall a peaceful race? Cain asked the logical question, Why shouldn't it? The laws of God have always been laws of justice and mercy. Not even the Vulgarian state can change them. He thought of the way the state had changed the Lost Islands in one bloody, violent afternoon. Bren, watching his face, said, you are skeptical and bitter, my son, but you will learn that a harmless old man can speak with wisdom. No, he said, there is neither justice nor mercy in the universe. I know from experience. 
a man can only choose between the lesser of two evils, and almost anything is less evil than Yenor when he's mad. He went to the plant the next morning. Inside, wherever he looked, he saw girls in shorts and halters. The place seemed to be alive with partially clad women. He went to the nearest bulletin board and read Bren's edict of four days before. Since the excessively warm temperature of the plant causes much discomfort and thereby impairs the efficiency of all workers, and since maximum efficiency will be required to produce the fuel in the extremely short time permitted us, it is suggested that the cool sunsuits of the Beachville girls become the standard work uniform until further notice. These may be obtained for the asking in Department 5A. The next day's edict read, Some have hesitated to follow yesterday's edict through a sense of modesty. This is most commendable. However, the situation is very critical. Our lives depend upon the highest degree of efficiency we can attain, and a hot, miserable worker is not efficient. Your bodies are God's handwork. Do not be ashamed of them. The edict for the next day read simply, warningly, Thou shalt not commit adultery. The Bulgarian guards and inspectors, now in tropical uniforms, still looked out of place with their holstered weapons, but their former cold arrogance was gone, and the attitude of the girls had changed from polite reserve to laughing, chattering friendliness. He found Dalen in a far corner cornered literally by the red-haired personnel supervisor who was spitting like a cat as she said. Then tell your commander how one of your men tried to make one of my girls and got hit with a wrench for it. Ask him whether he wants us to produce fuel or make love. Go ahead, ask him. Or let me. I'll ask him. You'll have to see to it that your girls don't lead my men on. Dalen ran his finger around his collar, worry on his face. "'Florence, are you trying to get me ruined? "'Then inform your men that there is a certain commandment we all believe in, "'and anything beyond our willingness to be friends calls for marriage first. "'Marriage?' "'Dalen sputtered the word, recovered his poise with an effort, and said stiffly, "'My men are soldiers, not suitors. I want them respected as such.' "'He strode away without seeing Cain. "'The girl stared after him, fuming.' and Kane went in search of Graver. Graver and the brown-eyed secretary were in LaRue's office, their heads together over a flow sheet of some kind. The secretary excused herself, and when she was gone, Kane asked, "'Where's LaRue?' "'Checking the catalytic processors, I think, sir,' Graver answered almost vaguely. "'Mar, his secretary, was just showing me how they improvise so much of their equipment so quickly.' There was a strange light in Graver's usually expressionless eyes. It's incredible. Well, the commander gave them no time to waste, you know. Sir, oh, I was referring to her intelligence, sir. It is amazing that a woman should have such a thorough knowledge of such a complex process. Kane felt the birth pains of the first dark premonition. If you don't want a thorough knowledge of the interior of state prison, he said in grim warning. "'You'd better get that silly look off your face "'and concentrate on your duties. "'Tell Dalen the same order applies to him. "'And tell LaRue that the commander reminds him "'they now have less than forty hours to finish the job.' "'He decided, again, to walk back to the ship. "'There was now a multitude of paths through the grass "'where the girls had been walking to and from work. Two groups from the last shift change "'were a short distance ahead of him.' several of Dalen's guards and Graver's technicians among them, all of them talking and laughing. In that area they could not be spied upon by Yenor with the ship's viewscreen scanners, and even as he watched, a tall, dark young guard put his arm around the girl walking close beside him. She twisted away from him and ran on to the next group, there to look back with a teasing toss of her head. Kane watched both groups disappear over the hill, then followed, muttering thoughtfully. He felt he could safely assume, if anything could be said to be safe about the situation, that the lack of discipline he had just witnessed was typical of all the men. They were all young and healthy, and for sixteen hours out of each day they were side by side with the almost nude, 
provocatively feminine sanctuary girls. Their weakness was understandable. It was also very dangerous. Heads would roll if Yanor ever learned what was going on, and it required no psychic ability to guess whose head would roll the fastest and farthest. He would have to have it stopped at once. He took a short cut to Bren's cottage, by a sleepy, shady street he had never been down before. Halfway along it was an open-air eating place of some kind, with tables placed about under the trees. There seemed to be no customers at the moment, but he stopped, anyway, to take a closer look for errant guards. A tawny head lifted at a table half-hidden by a nearby tree, and he looked into the surprised face of the mountain girl, Barbara. "'Well,' she said, "'come on over and let me offer you a glass of cyanide.' He walked over to her table. She was wearing a blouse and skirt similar to that of the day he had met her, but the pistol was gone. "'I thought I told you to go back to your hills,' he said. "'I decided it would be more fun to work in the plant and sabotage things. "'Let Yanor learn you said that, and you'll be in a fix I can't help you out of. "'Should a Bulgarian care?' "'But the jeering was gone, as she said. "'When you gave my pistol back to me, I thought it was a trick of some kind. "'I told you I wasn't your enemy.' I know, but it's hard for a saint to believe any Vulgarian could ever be anything else. It doesn't seem to be very hard for the girls in the plant, he observed glumly. Oh, that's different. She made a gesture of light dismissal. Those soldiers and technicians are good boys at heart. They haven't been brainwashed like you officers. That's interesting to know, I'm sure. I suppose... He stopped as a gray-haired woman came and sat down a tray containing a sandwich and a mug. From the foamy top of the mug came the unmistakable aroma of beer. "'Do you saints drink?' he asked incredulously. "'Sure, why? But your church?' "'Earth churches used to ban alcohol as sinful because it would cause a mean person to show his true character. My church is more sensible and works to change the person's character instead.' She took a bite of the sandwich. Cliff bear steak and beer go perfectly together. Shall I order you some? No, he said, thinking of Yanor's fury. If Yanor should learn he had had a friendly lunch with a native girl. About your church, what kind of church is it anyway? What its name implies. Heaven isn't for sale at the pulpit. Everybody has to qualify for it by his own actions. We have to practice our belief. Just looking pious and saying that we believe doesn't count. He revised his opinion of the saints, then asked, But you were practicing your golden rule when you came to this town with a gun to shoot Bulgarians. For Bulgarians we have a special golden rule that reads, Do unto Bulgarians as they have come to do unto you. And you came here to enslave or kill us, remember? It could not be denied. When he did not answer, she smiled at him, a smile surprisingly gentle and understanding. You honestly would like to be our friend, wouldn't you? The state psychiatrist didn't do a good job of brainwashing you after all. It was the first time since he was sixteen that anyone had spoken to him with genuine kindness. It gave him a strange feeling, a lonely sense of something rising up out of the past to mock him, and he changed the subject. Are the Azure Mountains the edge of your frontier? She nodded. Beyond is the Emerald Plain, a great wide plain, and beyond it are mountain ranges that have never been named or explored. I am going into them some day, and... Time passed with astonishing speed as he talked with the girl, and it was late in the afternoon when he continued on to Bren's cottage. He put the thoughts of her from his mind and told Bren of the too warm association between the girls and the Bulgarians. But it is only friendship, Bren said soothingly. I can assure your commander that nothing immoral is being done. If he knew what was going on, it would be my neck. It has to be stopped. Write an edict. Do anything that will stop it at once. Bren stroked his white beard thoughtfully. I'm sorry this unforeseen situation has occurred, sir. Will you have strict orders to the same effect given your men? 
there's a severe penalty for unauthorized fraternization. I'll see that they're well reminded of it. I'll write another edict at once, forbidding the girls to speak to your men, sir. Enor was pacing the floor when Kane went to the ship, his face black and ugly with anger. Have you been blind? he demanded. Kane tried to swallow a sinking feeling, wondering just how much Enor had seen, and said, Sir? My guards, my so-called guards, how long have they been strolling back from the plant in company with the native women? Oh, he said, feeling a great relief that Enor had not seen the true situation. It's only that some of the outgoing shifts coincide, sir, and... You know, don't you, that military men march to and from duty in military formation. You are aware of the importance of discipline. Yes, sir. You are further aware of the fact that you, Dalen and Graver, will be guilty of treason if this lack of discipline imperils my plans in any way. Yes, sir. You have heard of the punishment for treason? Yes, sir. He went below when the unpleasant business with Enor was finally over. It was the beginning of the eight-hour sleep period for Dalen and Graver, but they were still up, sitting on their bunks and staring dreamily into space. It was only belatedly, almost fuzzily, that they became aware of his glowering presence in the doorway. "'I bring you glad tidings,' he said, from the commander's own lips." The multiple gallows at state prison is still in perfect working order, especially the first three trap doors. The last day dawned, bright and sunny, and he went to see Bren. I had the new edict posted immediately, Bren said. I hope it will undo the damage. Let's see it, Kane requested, and Bren handed him the handwritten original. It was, Despite our affection for the vulgarians among us, we must not endanger them by any longer talking to them. A Vulgarian military rule is now being enforced which forbids Vulgarians to speak to sanctuary girls except in the line of duty. There is a severe penalty for those who disobey this rule. It must also be pointed out, sternly to the sanctuary girls and respectfully to the Vulgarians, that flight into the uninhabited sanctuary mountains would result in execution for the fleeing couples if Commander Yenor should ever find them. What's this? Kane demanded, pointing to the last paragraph. Why, a warning, sir. Warning? It's a suggestion. A suggestion? Bren lifted his hands in shocked protest. But, sir, how could anyone think... I personally wouldn't give a damn if the entire crew was too lovesick to eat. But the commander does and my future welfare, including the privilege of breathing, depends upon my retaining what passes for his good will. Good heavens, I shall have this edict removed from the bulletin boards at once. A great idea. It should fix up everything to lock the stable door now that the horse is stolen. He went to the plant and felt the air of resentment as soon as he stepped inside. Dalen was patrolling among his men, his haggard face becoming more haggard each time the red-haired personnel supervisor went by with her hips swinging and her head held high in hurt, aloof silence. The guards were pacing their beats in wordless quiet. Graver's technicians were speaking only in the line of duty. The girls were not talking even to one another, but in the soft, melting glances they gave the vulgarians, they said, we understand in a manner more eloquent than any words. In fact, far too eloquent. He considered the plan of having Bren forbid the girls to look at the guards, discard that as impractical, for a moment wildly considered ordering the guards not to look at the girls, discarded that as even more impractical, and went muttering to LaRue's office. LaRue was at his desk, his face lined with fatigue. It's been a difficult job, he said, but we'll meet the deadline. Good, Kane answered. Did Bren phone you about having that edict removed? Ah, which one? Which one? You mean... He turned and ran from the office. A girl was removing the offending edict from the nearest bulletin board. Another, later one, proclaimed. 
we must abandon as hopeless the suggestion of some that if there must be an occupation force we would like for it to be these men whom we have come to respect and many of us to love this can never be only commander yanor will leave the ship at vogar there to select his own occupation force while the men now among us continue directly on to the alcorian war from which many of them will never return we must not resent the fact that on this their last day among us these men are forbidden to speak to us or to let us speak to them nor say that this is unfair when commander yanor's occupation troops will be permitted to associate freely with us these things are beyond our power to change we must accept the inevitable and show only by our silent conduct the love we have for these warriors whom we shall never see again Kane gulped convulsively read it again and hurried back to larue's office how long has that last edict been up he demanded about twelve hours then every shift has seen it ah uh, yes why is something wrong with it that depends on the viewpoint I want them removed at once, and tell that sanctified old weasel that if this last edict of his gets me hanged, which it probably will, I'll see to it that he gets the same medicine. He went back into the plant and made his way through the bare-legged, soft-eyed girls, looking for Dalen. He overheard a guard say in low, bitter tones to another, Maybe eight hours on Vogar, and we can't leave the ship. Then on to the battlefront for us while Yanor and his home guard favorites come back here and pick out their harems. He found Dalen and said to him, Watch your men, they're resentful. Some of them might even desert. And Yanor wasn't joking about that gallows for us last night. I know, Dalen ran his finger around the collar that seemed to be getting increasingly tighter for him. I've warned them that the occupation troops would get them in the end. He found Graver at a dial-covered panel. The brown-eyed secretary, her eyes darker and more appealing than ever, was just leaving, a notebook in her hand. Since when, Kane asked, has it been customary for technicians to need the assistance of secretaries to read a dial? But, sir, she is a very good technician herself. Her paperwork is now done and she was helping me trace a circuit that was fluctuating. Kane peered suspiciously into Graver's expressionless face. Are you sure that it was a circuit that was doing the fluctuating? Yes, sir. Did you know that half of Dalen's guards seem to be ready to jump ship? Yes, sir, but the resentment is not characteristic of my technicians. He realized with surprise that that was true. And Graver, in contrast to Dalen's agitation, had the calm purposeful air of a man who had pondered deeply upon an unpleasant future and had taken steps to prevent it i have no desire to hang sir and i have convinced my men that it would be suicide for part of them to desert i shall do my best to convince dalen's guards of the same thing he went back through the plant much of its confidence restored and back to the ship yanor was pacing the floor again his impatience keen him to a mood more vile than ever. This ship will leave at exactly 2315, vulgar time, Yanor said. Any man not on it then will be regarded as a deserter and executed as such when I return with the occupation force. He stopped his pacing to stare at Kane with the ominous anticipation of a spider surveying a captured fly. Although I can operate this ship with a minimum of two crewmen, I shall expect you to make certain that every man is on board. Kane went back out of the ship, his confidence shaken again, and back to the plant. Night came at last, and finally, the first shielded tank of fuel was delivered to the ship. Others followed, one by one, as the hours went by. It was almost morning when Graver came to him and said, My duties and those of my men are finished here, sir. "'Shall we go prepare the ship for flight?' "'Yes, get busy at it,' Kane answered. "'Don't give the commander any excuse to get any madder than he already is.' An hour later the last of the fuel went into the last tank and was hauled away. Someone said, "'That's all,' and a switch clicked. 
a machine rumbled off into silence, followed by others. Control panels went dark. Within a minute there was not a machine running, not a panel lighted. Dalen's whistle for guard assembly sounded high and shrill. A girl's voice called to one of the guards. Hurry back to your ship, Billy. The Thunderhawks might get you if you stayed, and broke on a sob. Another girl said, Hush, Julia, it's not his fault. He went out of the plant and passed LaRue's office. He saw that the brown-eyed secretary was gone, her desk clean. LaRue was still there, looking very tired. He did not go in. The fuel had been produced. He would never see LaRue again. He took the path that led toward town. Part of the Whirlpool star cluster was still above the horizon, a white blaze of a thousand suns, and the eastern sky was lighting with the first rays of dawn. A dozen girls were ahead of him, their voices a low murmur as they hurried back toward town. There was an undertone of tension, all of the former gaiety gone. The brief week of make-believe was over, and the next Vulgarians to come would truly be their enemy. He came to the hilltop where he had met the mountain girl, thought of her with a rational longing, and suddenly she was there before him. The pistol was again in her belt. "'You came with all the stealth of a plain ox, she said. "'I could have shot you a dozen times over. "'Are we already at war?' he asked. "'We saints have to let you Vulgarians kill some of us first. First, our penalty for being ethical. "'Listen to me,' he said. "'We tried to fight the inevitable in the Lost Islands. "'When the sun went down that day, "'half of us were dead and the rest prisoners.' and you rose from prisoner to officer because you're too selfish to keep fighting for what was right. I saw them bury the ones who insisted on doing that. And you want us to meekly bow down here. I have no interest of any kind in this world. I'll never see it again. But I know from experience what will happen to you and your people if you try to fight. I don't want that to happen. Do you think that because a man isn't a blind chauvinist, he has to be a soulless monster? No, she said in a suddenly small voice. But I had hoped. We were talking that day of the mountains beyond the Emerald Plain and a frontier to last for centuries. It was just idle talk, but I thought maybe that when the showdown came you would be on our side, after all. She drew a deep breath that came a little raggedly and said with a lightness that was too forced, "'You don't mind if I have a silly, sentimental fondness for my world, do you? It's the only world I have. Maybe you would understand if you could see the azure mountains in the spring, but you never will, will you? Because you lied when you said you weren't my enemy, and now I know you are, and I—' The lightness faltered and broke— I'm yours, and the next time we meet, one will have to kill the other. She turned away and vanished among the trees like a shadow. He was unaware of the passage of time as he stood there on the hill that was silent with her going, and remembering the day he had met her, and the way the song swans had been calling. When he looked up at the sky, it was bright gold in the east, and the blazing stars of the whirlpool were fading into invisibility. He looked to the west, where the road wound its long way out of the valley, and he thought he could see her trudging up it, tiny and distant. He looked at his watch and saw he had just enough time to reach the ship before it left. Bren was standing by his gate, watching the dawn flame into incandescence and looking more frail and helpless than ever. The cruiser towered beyond, blotting out half the dawn sky like a sinister omen. A faint, deep hum was coming from within it as the drive went into the preliminary phase that preceded take-off. "'You have only seconds left to reach the ship,' Bren said. "'You have already tarried almost too long.' "'You're looking at a fool,' he answered, "'who is going to tarry in the Azure Mountains and beyond the Emerald Plain for a hundred days. Then the occupation men will kill him.' There was no surprise on Bren's face, but it seemed to Cain that the old man smiled in his beard. For the second time since he was sixteen, Cain heard someone speak to him with gentle understanding. 
although you have not been much help to my plans your intentions were good i was sure that in the end this would be your decision i am well pleased with you my son a whine came back from the ship and the boarding ramp flicked up like a disappearing tongue the black opening of the airlock seemed to wink then was solid featureless metal as the doors slid shut bon voyage you know kane said We'll be waiting for you with our bows and arrows. There is no one on the ship but Ynor, Bren said. Graver saw to it that the ready lights were all going on the command room control board. Then he and all the others followed my suggestion. Kane remembered Graver's calmness and his statement concerning his men. It would be suicide for part of them to desert. For part of them, if every last one deserted... The drives of the ship roared as Yanor pushed a control button and the ship lifted slowly. The roaring faltered and died as Yanor pushed another button which called for a crewman who was not there. The ship dropped back with a ponderous thud, careening, and fell with a force that shook the ground. It made no further sound or movement. He stared at the silent, impotent ship, finding it hard to realize that there would be no hundred-day limit for him that the new world, the boundless frontier, and Barbara, would be his for as long as he lived. Poor Commander Yanor, Bren said. The airlock is now under the ship, and we shall have to dig a tunnel to rescue him. Don't hurry about it, Kane advised. Let him sweat in the dark for a few days with his desk wrapped around his neck. It will do him good. We are a kind, harmless race. We could never do anything like that. Kind? I believe you, but harmless? You made monkeys out of Bogar's choicest fighting men. Please do not use such an uncouth expression. I was only the humble instrument of a greater power. I only, uh, encouraged the natural affection between man and maid, the love that God intended them to have. But did you practice your golden rule? You saw to it that fifty men were forced to associate day after day with hundreds of almost naked girls. Would you really have wanted the same thing done to you if you had been in their place? Would I? There was a gleam in the old eyes that did not seem to come from the brightness of the dawn. I, too, once was young, my son. What do you think? End of section 14《Section 15 of 20 Short Science Fiction Stories by Various Authors》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Measure for a Loner by Jim Harmon You can measure everything these days. Heat, light, gravity, reflexes, force fields, star drives. And now I know there is even a measure for a loner. — So, General... I came to tell you I found the loneliest man in the world for Space Force. How am I supposed to rate his loneliness for you? In mega sorrows or kilo fears? I suspect I know quite a library on the subject, but you know more about stripes and bars. Don't try to stop me this time, General. Now that you mention it, I'm not drunk. I had to have something to back me up, so I stopped off at the dispensary and stole a needle. I want you to get off my back with that kind of talk. I've got enough there, and it bends me over like I had bad kidneys. It isn't any of King Kong's little brothers. They overrate the stuff. It isn't the way you've been writing me, either. Never mind what I'm carrying. Whatever it is, and believe me, it is, I have to get rid of it. Let me tell it, for God's sake. Then, for security's sake... I thought you would let me tell it, General. I've been coming in here and giving you pieces of it for months now, but now I want to let you be drenched in the whole thing. You're going to take it all. There were the two of them, the two lonely men, and I found them for you. You remember the way I found them for you. The intercom on my desk made an electronic noise at me, and the words I'd been arranging in my mind for the morning letters splattered into alphabet soup like a printer dropping a prepared slug of type. I made the proper motion to still the sound. Yes, I grunted. My secretary cleared her throat on my time. 
Dr. Thorne, she said, there's a Mr. Madison here to see you. He lays claim to be from the Star Project. He could come in and file his claim, I told the girl. I rummaged in the waste basket and uncrumpled the morning's facsimile newspaper. It was full of material about the Star Project. We were building man's first interstellar spaceship. A surprising number of people considered it important. Flipping from the rear to page one, Wild Bill Star in the comics, who had been blasting all the way to 41st subspace universe for decades, was harking back to the good old days of man's first star flight, which he had made himself through the magic of time travel. The editor was calling the man to make the jaunt the Lindbergh of space, and the staff photographer displayed a still of Space Force pilot in pressure suit up front with his face blotted out by an airbrushed interrogation mark. Who was going to be the Lindbergh of space? We had used up the Columbus of space, the Magellan of space, the Van Reck of space. Now it was time for the Lone Eagle, one man who had weighed out the light years to Alpha Centauri. I remembered the first Lindbergh. I rode a bus fifty miles to see him at an Air Force Day celebration when I was a dewy-eared kid. It's funny how kids still worship heroes who did everything before they were even born. Uncle Max had told me about standing outside the hospital with a bunch of boys his own age, the evening Babe Ruth died of cancer. Lindbergh seemed like an old man to me when I finally saw him, but still active. Nobody had forgotten him. When his speech was over, I cheered him with the rest, just as if I knew what he had been talking about. But I probably knew more about what he meant then as a boy than I did feeling the reality of the newspaper in my hands. Grown up, I could only smile at myself for wanting to go to the stars myself. Madison rapped on my office door and breezed in efficiently. I've always thought Madison was a rather irritating man, likable but irritating. He's too good-looking in an assuming masculine way to dress so neatly. It makes him look like a mannequin. The polite way of his using small words slowly and distinctly proves that he loves his fellow man, even if his fellow always does have less brains or authority than Madison himself. That belief would be forgivable in him if it wasn't so often true. Madison folded himself into the canary yellow client's chair at my direction and took a leather-bound pocket secretary from inside his almost too snug jacket. Dr. Thorne, he said expansively, we need you to help us locate an atavism. I flicked a professional smile, no. Three at him lightly. I'm a historical psychologist, I told him. That sounds in my line. Which of your ancestors are you interested in having me analyze? I used the word atavism to mean a reversion to the primitive. I made a pencil mark on my desk pad. I could make notes as well as he could read them. Yes, I see, I murmured. We don't use the term that way. Perhaps you don't understand my work. It's been an honest way to make a living for a few generations, but it's so specialized it might sound foolish to someone outside the psychological industry. I psychoanalyze historical figures for history books, of course, and scholars, interested descendants, what all, and that's all I do. What you have done, Madison admitted, but your government is certain you can do this new work for them. In fact, that you are one of the few men prepared to locate this esoteric, that is, this odd aberration, since I understand you often have to deal with it in analyzing the past. Doctor, we want you to find us a lonely man. I laid my chrome yellow pencil down carefully beside the cream-colored pad. History is full of loneliness. Most of the so-called great men were rather neurotic, but I thought, Madison, that introspection was pretty much a thing of the, well, past. The government representative inhaled deeply and steepled his manicured fingers. Our system of childhood psychoconditioning succeeds in bearing loneliness in the subconscious so completely that even the records can't reveal if it was ever present. I cleared my throat in order to stall, to think. I'm not acquainted with contemporary psychology, Madison. This comes as news to me. You mean people aren't really well-adjusted today, 
that they have just been conditioned to act as if they were. He nodded. Yes, that's it. It's ironic. Now we need a lonely man and we can't find him. To pilot the interstellar spaceship? For the evening star, yes, Madison agreed. I picked up my pencil and held it between my two index fingers. I couldn't think of a damn thing to say. The whole problem, Madison was saying, goes back to the early days of space travel. Men were confined in a small area facing infinite space for measureless periods in free fall. Men cracked, and ships, they cracked up. But as space travel advanced, ships got larger, carried more people, more ties and reminders of human civilization. Pilots became more normal. I made myself look up at the earnest young man. But now, I said, now you want me to find you an abnormal pilot who is used to being alone, who can stand it, maybe even like it? Right. I constructed a genuine smile for him for the first time. Madison, do you really think I can find your man when evidently all the government agencies have failed? The government representative pocketed his notebook deftly, then spread his hands clumsily for an instant. At least, doctor, he said, you may know it if you do find him. It was a lonely job to find a lonely man, General, and maybe it was a crooked job to walk a crooked mile to find a crooked man. I had to do it alone. No one else had enough experience in primitive psychology to recognize the phenomenon of loneliness, even as Madison had said. The working condition suited me. I had to think by myself, but I had a comfortable staff to carry out my ideas. I liked my new office and the executive apartment the government supplied me. I had authority and respect, and I had security. The government assured me they would find further use for my services after I found them their man. I knew this was to keep me from dragging my tracks, but nevertheless I got right down to work. I found Gordon Maverick exactly five weeks from the day Madison first visited me in my old office. Of course, I planned the whole thing, Dr. Thorne, Gordon said crisply. I knew what he meant, although I hadn't guessed it before. He could tell it to me himself, I decided. Doesn't seem too much to brag about, I said. Anybody who can make up a grocery list should be able to figure out how to isolate himself on Seal Island. He sat forward, a lean Viking with a hot Latin glance, very confident of himself. I reckoned on you locating me, on you hustling me back to pilot the evening star. That's why I hold in here. I can't accept your story, I lied cheerfully. Nobody is going to maroon himself on an island for three years because of a wild possibility like that. Maverick smiled and his sureness swelled out until it almost jabbed me in the stomach. I took a broad gamble, he said, but it hit the wire, didn't it? I didn't reply, but he had his answer. I scanned the report Madison had given me from intelligence concerning the man's unorthodox behavior. Maverick had quit his postgraduate studies and passed by the secure job that had been waiting for him eighteen months in a genial government office to barricade himself in an old shelter on Seal Island. It was hard to know what to make of it. He had brought impressive stores of food with him, books, sound and vision tapes, but not telephone or television. For the next three years he had had no contact with humanity at all. And he said he had planned it all. Sure, he drawled. I knew the government was looking for somebody to steer the interstellar ship that's been gossip for decades. That job, he said distinctly, is one I would give a lot to settle into. I looked at him across my unlittered brand-new desk and accepted his irritating blonde masculinity, disliked him, admired him, and continued to examine him to decide on my final evaluation. "'You've given three years already,' I said, examining the sheets of the report with which I was thoroughly familiar. He twitched. He didn't like that, not spending three years. It was spendthrift, even if a good-bye. He was planning on winding up somewhere important, and to do it he had to invest his years properly. You're trying to make me believe you deliberately extrapolated the government's need for a man who could stand being alone for long periods, 
and then tried to phony up references for the work by staying on that island? I don't like that word, phony, Maverick growled. No, you name your word for it. Maverick unhinged to his full height. It was proof, he said, a test. A man can't test himself. A lot you know, the big blonde snorted. I know, I told him dryly. A man who isn't a hopeless, manic depressive can't consciously create a test for himself that he knows he will fail. You proved you could stay alone on an island, Buster. You didn't prove you could stay alone in a spaceship out in the middle of infinity for three years. Why didn't you rent a conventional rocket and try looking at some of our local space? It all looks much the same. Maverick sat down. I don't know why I didn't do that, he whispered. Probably for the first time since he had got clever enough to beat up his big brother, Maverick was doubting himself, just a little, for just a time. I don't know whether it was good or bad for him. Contemporary psychology isn't my line, but I knew I couldn't trust a cocky kid. But I had to find out if he could still hit the target uncocked. Stan Johnson was our second lonely man, remember, General? He was stubborn. I questioned him for half an hour the first day, two hours the second, and on the third I turned him over to Madison. Then as I was having my lunch I suddenly thought of something and made steps back to my office. I got there just in time to grab Madison's bony wrist. The thing in his fist was silver and sharp, a hypodermic needle. Johnson's forearm was tanned below the torn pastel sleeve. Two sad-faced young men were holding him politely by the shoulders in a canvas chair. Johnson met my glance expressionlessly. I tugged on Madison's arm sharply. What's in that damn sticker? Polypentheum. Madison's face was as blank as Johnson's. Only his body seemed at once tired and taut. What's it for? I rasped. You're the psychologist, he said sharply. I met his eyes and held on, but it was impossible to stare him down. I don't know about physical methods, I told you. I've been dealing with people in books, films, tapes all my life. Not living men up until now. Can't you absorb that? Apparently, I have more experience with these things than you then, doctor. Shall I proceed? You shall not, I cried omniscently. I know enough to understand we can't get the results the government wants by drugs. You going to put that away? Madison nodded once. All right, he said. I unshackled my fingers and he put the shiny needle away in his case, in his suit coat pocket. I understand, Thorn, he said, that the general won't like this. I turned around and looked at him. Did he order you to drug Johnson? The government agent shook his head. I didn't think so. I was beginning to understand government operations. He only wanted it done. Get out. Madison and his assistants marched out in orthodox Euclidean triangle formation. The doors hissed shut. You know what? The words jerked out from Johnson. I think the bunch of you are crazy. Crazy. I decided to treat him like a client. Maybe that was the way contemporary psychologists handled their men. I sat on the edge of the desk jauntily, confidently, and tried to let the domino mask up a father image. You may as well get us straight, Stan. The government needs you, and it's pointless for you to say that need is unconstitutional or anything. Bring it up and it won't be long. When survival is outside the rules, the rules change. The eyes of Johnson were strikingly like Maverick's, dark and unsettled. Only this boy, younger, smaller than the Nordic, had an appropriate skin tone, stained by the tropical sun somewhere in his ancestral past. He dropped his gaze, expelled his breath mightily, and pounded one angular knee with a half-closed fist. I'm not complaining about conscription without representation, doctor, but I can't make any sense out of these fool questions you keep firing at me. What in blazes are you trying to get at? What kind of reason are you after for my staying by myself? I just do it because I like it that way. With a galvanic jolt, I realized he was telling the painfully simple truth. I groaned at the realization. 
Maverick had convinced all of us that in our well-adjusted, or at any rate, well-conditioned world, somebody had to have some purposeful reason in loneliness, solitude. So on that one instance our thinking had already been patterned, discarding all the other evidence of generations that the lonely man was only a personality type, like Johnson. I felt I had achieved at least the quantum state of a fool. Johnson silently studied the half-cupped hands laying in his lap. The hunting lodge in the Andes seemed as good a place as any to live after mother and father were killed. You might think it was lonesome at night in the mountains, but it isn't at all. You aren't alone when you can watch the burning world shadow the bow of God. I cleared my throat. The poor kid sounded like he would begin spouting something akin to poetry next. So I believe you, I told him. That doesn't finish it. We have to convince them. I don't like this, but the simplest way would be to volunteer for their inhibitor injection. I found out Madison and his crowd don't believe men awake, only assorted dopes. Johnson deflated his area of the room with his breath intake. Okay, he said at last, I guess so. When Johnson gave us what we needed to clear the problem, it didn't take me long to finish processing the rest of the handful of possible loners we had located. Unlike Johnson, all the rest had reasons for their self-imposed loneliness. Unlike Maverick, none of their reasons were associated with the interstellar flight. They instead involved literary research, swindles, isolated paranoid insanity, and other things in which the government had no interest. Suddenly I found my job was done and that we had located only two of them. Madison read my final report, braced on the edge of my desk, his hand comradely on my shoulder. Good job, Doc, he vouched, replacing the papers on my blotter with a final rustle. Now I've got good news for you. The government wants you to test these boys for us now that you've found them for us. I closed my jaw. That's completely out of line. My line. I know you need a contemporary man for that job. Madison punched me on the bicep, fast enough to hurt. Doc, after this project you know more about contempt stuff than any professor who got his degree studying the textbooks you wrote. It was impossible to dislike Madison, except for practiced periods. That was probably one reason he had his job. All right, I growled. Get your dirty pants off my clean desk and I'll get out the bottle. We'll celebrate, huh? But you know how I felt, General. You remember how I tried to get out of it. I felt like I had led in the lambs and now I had to help shear them. As a part-time historian, I can tell you there's a word for that. Judas Goat. Give or take a word. It isn't the real thing, Doc, Madison spelled out for me, wearing a lemon twist of a smile. I looked at the twin banks of gauge facings and circuit housings in which center TV screens were picturing either Maverick or Johnson. Red and sea-green lights chased each other around the control boards, died, were born again. On the screens, the three color negatives mixed to purple, shifted through a series of wrong combinations and settled into normal as the stereo oscillation echoed, convexed insanely, and deepened to hold. Video reception is lousy from 500,000 miles out. I was too eye-heavy to be surprised. Don't tell me this is the strange flight of Richard Clayton all over again. Madison clapped me on the shoulder and breathed mint at me, eyes on twittering round faces. Who wrote that, Poe? No, no, mock up to fake space conditions for them, but calculate the cost of the real interstellar ship. We couldn't trust either of them with it yet. You didn't really think we could afford two ships. Why do you think we haven't told one man about his opposite in a second ship? No safety margin allowable in our appropriation, Doc. Or so they tell me. There's enough fuel and food to take Johnson and Maverick a long way, but not the distance. He shook his lean head almost wistfully. Damn it, Madison, what do you mean? I've been beating my lobes out for weeks for nothing. I tested them. I checked them out. Either was capable of making the flight successfully, for their own different reasons. 
Madison took his hand off my shoulder and made a fist of it. I'm not questioning your decision. Will you ram that through your obscene skull, Thorn? Who is? I whispered. Not me. Not I. Not I. The general, I announced. Just not me. Was he actually trembling? But it wasn't concern about what I thought of him. Somebody closer, maybe. Things were building up for him. He jammed his nose almost up against the glass dial surfaces, swaying gently in his cups, staring slightly cross-eyed at the arrowed numbers. You'll continue your test from here, Madison said. Tell them they're going to die. My face was at once cool and damp. That's a tough examination, I gasped. A lie, Madison told me. The boys at Psychic Center worked out the problems. You told me you wanted me, I screamed at him furiously. Control your passionate, dainty voice. You worked well with those two. The experts could work through you better. Right through me, like a razor blade through margarine, I said. It's not fair. No, it's science. Psychology is a science, not an art. Don't damn me. I'm not the inventor, Madison continued. I'm one of them, I murmured, but I'd just as rather you didn't blame me either. Madison punched the button for me with a palsied, manicured thumb. Guess what, Maverick, I said viciously. You're going to die. What the blazes are you babbling about? The blonde doll snapped at me from the box of the video screen. I scanned the type, stiff-backed idiot prompters Madison shoved into my fist. It's true, you can't get out alive. What's happened? His face perfectly blank. Nothing out of the ordinary, I said. They have just informed me it was planned this way. It wasn't possible to build a round-trip ticket yet. You need a lot of fuel to make course adjustments for the curvature of space, so forth. The radio will send back your reports on the Alpha Centurion planets. Undoubtedly, by all rules of probability, they won't support life without a massive equipment. They suckered me, too, Maverick. I swear. You turning back? No, he said almost immediately. I thought you were after the rewards, trained to get them. You won't be able to enjoy them posthumously. The video blanked. He had turned off his camera. I guess I thought so, Maverick's voice said. But I kind of like it out here, alone. I like people, but back there there's no one to touch. They smother you, but you can't reach them. I can't do anything better back there than I can do here. Madison got a bottle, and he and I got sloppily drunk, leaning on each other, singing innocently obscene songs of our youth. The technicians, good government men, were openly disgusted with us. Two hours after we had contacted Maverick, I left Madison snoring on the desk and lurched to the control board bunching my soiled shirt at the throat with my hand. I called Johnson. Going to die, Johnson. Tricked you. Can't get back, Johnson. Not ever. No fuel. Ha! Huh, you can't ever go home again, Johnson. Like that, you damned runny-nosed little poet. His dark face worked weakly. Ha! Huh, he sure as thunderation didn't like it. He asked for the bloody details, and I fed them to him. Turning back, aren't you? I jeered. I just wanted a place and time for thinking, he said across the solar system. But I'll die, and I don't know if you can dream in death. Just what I thought, I sneered. I'm not turning back, he said slowly. People need me. I've got a job to do, haven't I? Haven't I? No, I screamed at him. You're just using that as an excuse to kill yourself. Don't try to tell me you're not weak. Don't you try to make me think you're strong. Hear me, Johnson? Hear me? But he couldn't hear me. One of the government technicians had broken the contact before that last spurt. This is good, Madison said, pawning fuzzily at his pocket. Really good. I studied the three or four watch dials wobbling up and down my elongated wrist. They seemed to say it was almost sunrise. I leered at Madison. Yeah, yeah, what is it? Huh? Huh? He shoved a crumpled card into my lax fingers. Now, he said, now tell them. Yeah, yeah. 
Tell them the whole thing is useless. My stomach retched dryly, grinding the sober pills to dust between its ulcerating walls. Maverick, I said to the empty video tube, they made a mistake. They underestimated the curvature. You can't reach Alpha Centauri. You can't correct enough. Free space is all you'll hit, ever. You may as well come home. The voice came out of nowhere, from nothing. I don't want to come back. I like it here. This is what I've always been trying to get, and I never knew it. Madison grabbed my arm with pronged fingers. Shut up, Doc. That's just the way the government wants him to be. Johnson, I said to the creased face on the screen. They made a mistake. They underestimated curvature. You can't reach Alpha Centauri. You can't correct enough. Free space is all you'll hit, ever. You may as well come back. Johnson sighed, a whisper of breath across the miles. I'll keep going. No one has ever been so far out before. I can report valuable things. I stood there. The textbook's report it takes muscular effort to frown, more so than to smile. But my face seemed to flow into the lines of pain so hard it ached without any effort of my will, and I knew it would hurt to smile. They passed the final test, Madison said at my side. Tell them it was a test. I would do it for him. I didn't need to do it for myself. I motioned the technician to open both channels. The ship you are in, I said, with no need to tell them of each other, is not the real evening star. It will not take you to the stars. This has only been a test to credit your fitness to pilot the real interstellar craft of the star project. You must return to the lunar satellite. This is a direct order. The two screens remained blank. Only the windless silence of space echoed over Johnson's channel. But the tapes later proved that I actually did hear a whispered laugh from Maverick. I faced Madison. They won't come back. They could have passed any test except the fact that what we put them through was only a test. For their own reasons, they will keep going. As far as they can. Madison took out his notebook and seemed to look for vital information. Except that he never cracked the cover. Of course, we can't get them back if they won't come, he said. If cybernetic remotes functioned operationally at this distance, we wouldn't have to send men at all. He replaced the pocket secretary and looked at me edgewise, speculatively. I touched his arm. Let's find another bottle, I said. He stepped back. You found them. You tested them. You killed them. And the government man walked away and left me standing with a murderer. You see it now, don't you, General? What I'm carrying around on my back is guilt. Not a guilt complex, not guilt fixation, just plain old Abel Cain guilt. In this nice, well-ordered age, I'm a killer and everybody knows it. You see our mistake, General. We sent men with variable amounts of loneliness. These amounts could alter, but now we have a golden opportunity. The evening star is waiting, and I have found for you a man with the true measure of loneliness. It is impossible for this man to become any more or any less lonely. It isn't the ultimate possible loneliness. Understand that, General? It's just that by himself or with others, he is always in a crowd of three, no more, no less. The interstellar ship is waiting. So tell me, General, have you ever seen a lonelier man than me? your humble servitor, Dr. Thorne. No, I mean it. Have you? End of section 15。section 16 of 20 short science fiction stories by various authors。this librivox recording is in the public domain。walls of acid by Henry Hass。Five millenniums have passed since the loathsome termins were eliminated from the world of Discra. But what of the other planets? Brainall stirred, throbbed sluggishly once, then lay quiescent as his mental self surged up from the deeps of non-entity, and gradually came to know that someone had entered the room, his room, far beneath the city. 
now he could feel the vibra currents through the liquids of the huge tanks where he had lain somnolent for untold eons it was pleasant caressing for a moment he floated there enjoying to the utmost this strange sensation as the renewed thought life force set his every convolution to pulsing to be once more aware oh gloriously aware the thought came fierce and vibrant once more they have awakened me but how long has it been then curiously and what can they want this time the huge brain was alert now with a supernal sense of keening tentatively he set out a thought potential that encompassed the room they're afraid he sensed to have entered here and they are afraid of me i shall remedy that brain all lowered his thought potential to one-eighth of the magnitude and felt his mind contact theirs approach my children he said kindly you have nothing to fear from me i take it you are the imperial messenger sent by her supreme magnificence the empress alizar he felt the fright slip from their minds but they were startled the empress udala reigns now forth in the royal line came the thought empress alizar died long ago i am truly grieved brain all flashed to them Alizar, may she rest in peace, did not neglect me. How well I remember her interest in the stories I could tell, stories of the Disker of old when we sent men out to glorious adventures on other planets. Aye, five millenniums ago it was that we achieved space travel. In those days, Brain all ceased his reminiscences, aware that these two were trying to get their thoughts through to him. That is why we have come. The Empress Udala, too, wishes a story, the story of the first space flight from Discra, and the events that brought it about, and of how you, I, of how I came to be as you see me now. I shall be delighted, my children, to tell it again. But first, prepare the trance to lecter so that it may be recorded faithfully. Brainall directed them to a machine on the far side of the room, and instructed them as to its operation. Soon the hundreds of tiny coils were humming, and a maze of tubes fed out of the machine, on which would be recorded Brainall's every thought. For the moment he paused, gently swaying, pulsing, a huge independent brain suspended in the pale green liquid. Then he began his story. Your Supreme Beneficence when the imperial messengers came to me, bringing the communication with which you deigned to address my decrepit solitude, it was like a glorious ray of light come to illumine the deepening darkness of my declining years. It is with trepidation that I set about to fulfill your exalted command. Five millenniums, I, even more, have passed since those who were part of that segment of history into which you inquire have become but drifting dust. Only within the feeble memory of your humblest servant is there any record of it. Five millenniums, I, that was truly the golden period of our beloved Discra. Not that our period under your serene effulgence is not golden indeed. But in that day all Discra was under the glorious rule of Paladin. His city on the scarlet shores of our central sea was the wonder of us all. I, we had a sea then where there is now but desert. The intelligent planets were three, our own discra, of course, forth from the sun, and the nearest the sun, Mirla, that fiery globe, where life apes the quality of our own salamander, existing by necessity near the flames, and second from the sun, Venia, the cloud-capped world, where life exalts the virtues of the fish. Of the third planet, Terra, we then knew little. Our cities faced the sun in those days, towering in polychromatic splendor. Height was no obstacle then, for we had wings, wings. Think of it, O oh beneficence! No need had we of clumsy metal vessels. But all that has changed. Now no whir of wings disturbs the air, and our formi textural splendors rise within. The history of this change is what your supreme exaltation would know. This, then, is the record. With the rule of Paladin was born the age of science, 
not so much due to the intellects of that day as through the driving urge of ultimate necessity. For Paladin had a brother, Thid. He was unfortunately a mutant. Whereas our features were delicate and quite regular, Thid's were gross and stamped with power. His royal head was too large and cumbersome, and instead of our slender waist, he was almost asymmetrical in shape. In short, no member of our fairer sex, royal sex, could look upon him with aught but horror. And it was because of this that he was dietetically conditioned for the realm of science. It was a mistake. As the years passed, the loneliness of his virtual exile tended to derange Thid's prodigious mind. I, prodigious, and dangerous in his manic depressive state. Then one day Paladin called an emergency meeting of the inner council. I, Brainall, was a member of that council. It has come to my attention, Paladin said, that Thid has been carrying on certain dangerous experiments. Experiments of that sort could well be inimical to us, to our very existence. We well knew to what Paladin referred, but Thid was his brother, one of the imperial ones, no one dared speak. Why was I not made aware of it sooner? Paladin demanded sternly. You, Brainall, you knew of it? Yes, Your Majesty, I was frightened. I beg to explain. I have tried to dissuade him. Paladin's visage became less stern, as though he understood our reluctance in this matter. True, he said, Thid is my brother. He must be mad. And I tell you now, if he has gone as far in this experiment as I suspect, I shall not hesitate to apply the only remedy dictated by efficiency, death. Have him brought to me at once. But Thid was nowhere to be found. He had learned of Paladin's anger, and had fled into the Discran desert where the abhorred Termans dwelt in myriads despite all our effort to eradicate them. These termans were soft-bodied, subterranean creatures with an obstinate life-force, and we had long realized that they might one day be a menace to us. So into the desert our Thid fled, spurred by the knowledge that his life was forfeit. For a time he was naturally thought dead. Who could survive unprotected the extremes of heat and cold? And if by a miracle he triumphed over the elements— how to survive the appalling anemone of the Termans, whose rudimentary brains conceived no mercy. Nevertheless, startling bits of rumor began to drift into our city, rumors that Thid had been seen, leading hordes of gigantic Termans across the desert wastes. We laughed, of course, for caravanners are ever the prey of sun mirages, and legends are dear to their souls. A legend was begun concerning Thid, Arriving caravans vied with each other in fantastic reports. Some had seen him with immense hordes of the repulsive Termans. Still others had discovered subterranean labyrinths being built by the Termans under his command, and had barely escaped with their lives. And still we laughed, blessed by the constant climate on the shores of our sea, and the beneficent rule of our exalted paladin. And then we ceased to laugh. Paladin called together his council of scientists. "'Can it be?' Paladin asked. Two whole caravans have vanished on the way to Eska, beyond the mountains. And he told us more, reports that had arrived from other cities. Survivors had arrived, with the light of madness in their eyes, babbling some nameless fear. Others had died from ghastly wounds, great burns that refused to heal.' but spread a kind of disease through the tissues. I, Brainall, examined some of these wounds and reported to Paladin. Only a perverted, scientific intellect such as Thid's could have evolved weapons to inflict such wounds. If he has organized the Termans, suggested another council member, despite their pygmy size, they will become a menace that cannot be ignored. We have delayed too long, thundered Paladin. Find Thid, I command it. An army, the greatest ever assembled on Discra, was sent forth to hunt out Thid and exterminate the Termans, whom he had managed to organize by heaven only knew what magic. 
the planet must be cleansed of that leprous form of life, else there would be no peace. But we did not know what depths of horror we were to plumb. Even now, O oh illustrious empress, reason reels and totters at the remembrance. I led one fine division of the imperial guards, armored warriors of the first magnitude. With them I felt able to conquer planets, not to speak of the trivial-sized termins. For many days we trekked, penetrating ever deeper the red desert's heart. But of the abhorred termins we caught no sight. There was only the molten downpour of sun by day, and the desiccating numbness of cold at night. But on the sixth day, as we encamped near an underground pool located by our experts, we encountered the termins. The blue wings of dusk were beating down when suddenly, from every rampart of sand dune, every crumbling hillock, out of the very bowls of the planet itself, they came like an avalanche. They carried slender metal tubes that spewed polychromatic death at us. Whenever the deadly discharge touched, would appear horrible burns that ate away the tissues. But that isn't what paralyzed us. We had known these vermin to be short of twelve inches tall, but now they reared monstrously four feet into the air. Their black hairy limbs lashed in an ecstasy of murder lust, their beady eyes gleamed with fiendish purpose and they had intelligent leaders. The sight of these monsters grown to such awful size struck terror into the hearts of our legion. Nevertheless, we, who are seven feet tall, towered above them as we fought with the strength and ferocity of desperation. Every weapon at our command was brought into play, and they were blasted and seared by the myriads. Still they came on, blindly, unswervingly, as if driven by a single prodigious force. How these life-forms had grown to such bestial proportions was not known until later. We captured a few and delicately probed them, while still alive, of course, dissecting their anatomy until we found that some genius had managed to control their growth through glandular development. That genius could have only been our thid. Soon the desert was covered by a sea of their dead and ours. The stench was unbearable, for the termins exude an odor of their own, particularly in death, which is sheer nausea. But lest I offend your refined sensibilities, O oh serene empress, perhaps it were best that I draw a veil of darkness over that shambles of horror. At last it seemed as if only utter annihilation of both sides would be the outcome. Already the battle had lasted for three obeisances of our discra to its parent son. And then wisely, our glorious paladin flashed to us the command to retreat. Already Eska and Kraj have fallen, with all the populace wiped out, said the message. The Termans are converging upon our capital city. Return here with all haste. So it was that we retreated. Those who remained of us, to the capital, and prepared to make a formidable stand. The other armies of our empire had done likewise. Who would have thought that this despised, destructive form of life could ever become such a menace? We remembered one of Thid's treatises on the noxious pests, in which he had maintained that they had rudimentary intelligence and an interesting, if sub-primitive, form of social life. How we had laughed at the thought of imputing a social order to these subterranean aphids. But we weren't laughing now. A race of malignant monsters had sprung up in the twenty years that Thid had vanished into the desert. Of Thid, nothing more was seen. But we knew he must still exist somewhere among the Termans. Under that baleful, inventive genius their weapons seemed to multiply, and we were forced to tax our scientists to the utmost in order to have weapons of defense, and yes, O oh beneficence, defense. For now, though we had managed to stem their attack on our capital, they were steadily encroaching on our territory. Underground lakes and streams were dammed by these fiends. Vast areas of vegetation were denuded. Precious mines of rare metals were converted by them, under Thid's direction, into sources for their ceaseless attacks. Aye, 
we died a thousand deaths multiplied a thousand times. Our ethereal magnum, by which our telepathic vibrations were amplified for planetary broadcast, became a monotonous recorder of tragedy as city after city fell to the hordes. For untold years this savage struggle went on. How well we realized that this was a war for sole dominance of the planet. Until at last, only our proud capital by the shores of the Scarlet Sea and its immense valley was left to us. We must evolve the principles of interspatial travel, Paladin told us sadly. The day may come when we shall need it. Hitherto, our rare flights to Venia and Mirla had been primitive affairs in which the dangerous Rocca principle was employed, with the terrific effects of acceleration crushing the crews and making landing an even greater hazard than the flight itself. But now, through inconceivable efforts of thought, I, through sheer desperation, our scientists evolved a system of atomic integration in which free orbital electrons were utilized to create atomic quantities beyond our known table, drawing upon the energy that could be harnessed in the process. It is difficult to describe otherwise than through pure mathematics, though if your serene effulgence wishes, I will be happy to describe it to you at a later date. It will take some little effort to recall the exact formulae. We must send an expedition to Terra, Paladin told us. From what we have been able to gather astronomically, that planet seems habitable. Mirla, we know, is out of the question. It is a holocaust of fire. And to dwell on the semi-aquatic world of Venia, a new environmental adaptation would be necessary. Fantastic, wasn't it, O oh exalted Empress? that we, the rightful lords of Discra, should be compelled to abandon our beloved homes by a horde of vermin. Indeed, it was a tragic day when the first scientific expedition was assembled, and I, Brainall, was honored beyond my humble deserts by this supreme magnificence, Paladin. I was assigned as recorder on the expedition. Strapped and cushioned, until not an inch of my body was visible, I was launched into space together with my fellow scientists within the spheroid confines of our atomic projectile. The agony of enduring, even for seconds, the required acceleration, will forever remain in my mind as the ultimate in torture. But at last the agony was gone, as we traveled at an unimaginable speed toward the planet which we hoped would be our future home. No, not hoped because meanwhile on Discra the experiments with acid gas were going on, in a sort of last-ditch defense which we hoped might stem the endless hordes. It was on the eleventh day that we really saw Terra in its full prismatic glory. For days it had loomed larger in our three-dimensional electrocone, where we studied its continents and oceans to select the likeliest spot for a landing. Terra was intensely blue now, rivaling in color the priceless zaffirines of our own discra. I hope in the humblest depths of my mind, O Empress Yudala, that you shall never know the unplumbed abyss of loneliness we all felt. At last we were forced to use the forward atomic beam to break our meteoric entrance to the heavy atmosphere. We had, of course, turned on the neutralizing frigirectifiers that formed a network on the outer shell of our sphere. At last we were through. Dipping lower as we circled, we discerned majestic oceans, ice-clad peaks crowning the stark glory of the landscape, and then more inviting lands crisscrossed by rivers and studded with shining lakes. It was to us, O oh great beneficence, a paradise indeed. Entranced, we all but forgot our landing which would require the utmost skill. Brunoge, our greatest navigator, was at the controls, padded and cushioned beyond the possibility of injury. The rest of us retired to the special crash room. I remember we carried in our laboratory, in a special container of glass iron, two embalmed specimens of the monstrous termins. These we were to show as a warning to whatever race existed here. One glance at the revolting monsters would have been enough for an intelligent race. Now that would not be necessary. Terra seemed uninhabited. 
We had seen no cities as we circumnavigated the globe. Had intelligent life forms failed as yet to materialize on this verdant world? We assumed that fact, in our joyous eagerness to feel the good earth beneath us. Prepare to land, came the warning from Brunoge. To this day I cannot say what happened. No one knew. For the brief instant in which I remained conscious, I felt as if Terra had burst asunder under the terrific impact. Nor do I know when I finally struggled upward from oblivion. It may have been hours later, or days. Many of us were dead. I was a hopelessly crushed horror who still lived somehow, miraculously. For many days we remained within our sphere, disposing of the dead, tending to the injured, conserving our strength. I might have been destroyed, but with that frantic will to live which rises within us, I flashed a message to my companions. I still live. Place me in the delocalizer. I will still be of use. This was done. The delocalizer reacted on the thalamic region of my brain, intercepted pain currents, and allowed me to exist without physical feeling. Only my mind, lucid and intensely alive as never before, continued to record the adventure in this world. It was not until later that my brain was completely dissevered from my crushed body. My companions had tested the atmosphere and found no gases that might have been inimical to our organisms. Thus they prepared for the greatest adventure of all, the emergence. The locks were opened. A draft of fragrant, if heavy, atmosphere swept through our globe. It was pleasantly invigorating and bright outside, so I was told by their telepathic messages, for I alone remained within. Telepathically they kept me informed, as they wandered up the narrow valley. The soil was firm and amazingly fertile. Vegetation grew thickly everywhere. They reached the far end of the valley at last, and rocky ramparts towered over them. Then it was, how can I begin to describe to you, exalted Empress? From their minds, coming back to me, was a sudden flood of excited, hysterical thought. It seemed filled with intense loathing and fear. Imagine me there, if you can, helpless and in a frenzy of despair, wondering what they could have encountered. Desperately I extended my potential. I managed to intuit a fierce battle in which they were engaging. Some of my companions were dying. Hordes of fierce denizens from the rocks above were descending upon them. They had taken weapons along, true, but I could sense now by their frantic thought that these warlike creatures of Terra numbered in the hundreds, with hordes of them swarming from beyond. For a long while the battle raged, then I sensed that my companions were retreating. Oh, I was glad, glad! At last I would not be left alone. But of the two score who had ventured out, only six returned. As they operated the lock of the ship and tumbled in, I could see, or rather perceive, a long part of the terrain behind them. Then it was that my mind sickened, for the creatures of this bright new world were termins, slightly different from those we had battled on Discra, true. These were even more monstrous, over six feet tall, with long shaggy manes and reddish fuzz covering their four limbs. Oh, beneficence, I swear it, sickening blue eyes. They walked upright and carried crude weapons, shafts of wood fitted with sharp-edged stone. Not until much later did my returning companions tell me what they had seen through their telescopic lenses. Just beyond this valley were vast plains where the termins seemed to number in the thousands, huge nomadic tribes of them. There were other creatures as well, some massive beyond all belief others fierce and blood-lusting with huge, saber-like teeth. We could colonize Terra indeed, was the consensus of our thoughts, but at what a price? To be forever battling these creatures, particularly the Termans, that abominable genus Homo. Can you imagine, O Empress Udala, how the irony of it bit us? 
it was almost more than we could bear to think that on discra our own genus formicae was in life or death struggle with these creatures and we had found them swarming here as well all all of this lush verdant world was defiled there was nothing we remaining seven could do now sadly we set about repairing the ship so that we could bear the awful tidings back to discra as we sped again toward our beloved planet a somber pall fell upon us the interchange of thoughts were brief and tinged with a profound despair this resolved into amazement however as we came ever closer to discra for now through our telectoscope we could see that our planet had been subtly altered a few symmetrical lines had appeared on the face of discra as if a cosmic hand had drawn straight lines across with mathematical precision not until we had safely landed did we learn the truth o oh, joyous news the hordes of termins had been repulsed and were even then being slowly driven back our scientists had created in the laboratories a type of formic acid somewhat similar to the vesictory secretion occurring within our own bodies but infinitely more deadly it had been used as a weapon against the termins and more huge walls of gaseous formic acid held unwavering by electronic force fields were being erected it was these walls that caused the astronomical illusion we had seen from space the rest o oh illustrious empress i believe you know well how the termins never again were able to penetrate our walls how we waged war on the detestable creatures for a number of years until finally no trace of them remained on discra ay five millenniums have passed since the events i have related five millenniums since my crushed body was done away with and i was preserved in my rectangle of glacerin with a constantly renovated thought life fluid kept exquisitely warm in this state i have accompanied many other expeditions to the planets in my capacity of official recorder but i am yours to command exalted princess should you wish to hear of them but i have a warning slowly i have developed a new sense that needs not eyes nor ears nor sense of touch no antennae even such as i once possessed but unites and transcends all these and i beg of you in my utmost abject humility do not venture to remove even one formic acid wall either from above or from its depth into the ground rather build more perceptively i shudder in the awful remembrance of their occasion and the day may come when they will be needed once more thus i warn humbly and remain your supreme fertility's most insignificant servant brainall End of section 16. Section 17 of 20 Short Science Fiction Stories by Various Authors. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Texas Week by Albert Hernhuter. Meeting the little man who isn't there is rated a horrendous experience but discovery that the man is there may be even worse. The slick black car sped along the wide straight street. It came to a smooth stop in front of a clean white house. A man got out of the car and walked briskly to the door. Reaching out with a pink hand, he pressed the doorbell with one well-manicured finger. The door was answered by a housewife she was wearing a white blouse a green skirt and a green apron trimmed with white her feet were tucked into orange slippers her blonde hair was done up in a neat bun she was dressed as the government had ordered for that week the man said are you mrs christopher nest there was a trace of anxiety in her voice as she answered yes and you are my name is maxwell hanstark as you may already know I am the official psychiatrist for this district. My appointment will last until the end of this year. Mrs. Nest invited him in. They stepped into a clean living room. At one end was the television set. At the other end were several chairs. There was nothing between the set and the chairs except a large gray rug which stretched from wall to wall. 
They walked to the chairs and sat down. Now, just what is the matter with your husband, Mrs. Nest? Mrs. Nest reached into a large bowl and absently picked up a piece of stale popcorn. She daintily placed it in her mouth and chewed thoughtfully before she answered. I wish I knew. All he does all day long is sit in the backyard and stare at the grass. He insists that he is standing on top of a cliff. Hans Stark took out a small pad and a short ballpoint pen. He wrote something down before he spoke again. Is he violent? Did he get angry when you told him there was no cliff? Mrs. Nest was silent for a moment. The second piece of popcorn joined the first. Hans Stark's pen was poised above the pad. No, he didn't get violent. Hans Stark wrote as he asked the next question. Just what was his reaction? He said I must be crazy. Were those his exact words? No, he said that I was. She thought for a moment. Loco. Yes, that was the word. Loco? Yes, he said it just like those cowboys on the television. Hans Stark looked puzzled. Perhaps you'd better tell me more about this. When did he first start acting this way? Mrs. Nest glanced up at the television set, then back at Hans Stark. It was right after Texas Week. You remember, they showed all of those old cowboy pictures. Hans Stark nodded. Well, he stayed up every night watching them. Some nights he didn't even go to sleep. Even after the set was off, he sat in one of the chairs, just staring at the screen. This morning, when I got up, he wasn't in the house. I looked all over, but I couldn't find him. I was just about ready to phone the police when I glanced out the window into the backyard, and I saw him. What was he doing? He was just sitting there in the middle of the yard, staring. I went out and tried to bring him into the house. He told me he had to watch for someone. When I asked him what he was talking about, he told me that I was crazy. That was when I phoned you, Mr. Hanstark. A very wise move, Mrs. Nest. And would you show me where your husband is right now? She nodded her head and they both got up from the chairs. They walked through the dining room and kitchen. On the back porch, Hanstark came to a halt. You'd better stay here, Mrs. Nest. He walked to the door and opened it. Mr. Hanstark, Mrs. Nest called. Hans Stark turned and saw her standing next to the automatic washing machine. Yes? Please be careful. Hans Stark smiled. I shall be, Mrs. Nest. He walked out of the door and down three concrete steps. Looking a little to his right, he saw a man squatted on his heels. He walked up to the man. You are Mr. Christopher Nest? The man looked up and stared for a moment at Hans Stark. Yep, he answered. Then he turned and stared at the grass again. And may I ask you what you were doing? Nest answered without looking up. Pardon the pass. Hans Stark scribbled something in his notebook. And why are you guarding the pass? Nest rose to his feet and stared down at Hans Stark. Just what are you asking all these questions for, stranger? Hans Stark saw Nest was bigger than he and decided to play along for a while. After all, strategy. I'm just interested in your welfare, Mr. Nest. Nest shrugged his shoulders. He reached into his shirt pocket and pulled out a sack of tobacco and some paper. Holding a piece of paper in one hand, he carefully poured a little tobacco into it. In one quick movement, he rolled the paper and tobacco into a perfect cylinder. He put the sack of tobacco and paper back into his pocket and took out a wooden kitchen match. He scraped it to life on the sole of his shoe and applied the flame to the tip of the cigarette. He puffed it into life and threw the match away. It burned for a few moments in the moist grass, then went out. A thin trail of smoke rose from it and then was gone. Why are you guarding the pass? Hans Stark asked again. Nest resumed his crouch on the grass. News is around that Dirty Dan the cattle rustler is going to try to steal some of my cattle. He patted an imaginary holster at his side, and I aimed to stop him. Hans Stark thought for a moment. Strategy. He must use strategy. Mr. Nest. He waited until Nest had turned to him. Mr. Nest, what would you say if I told you that there was no pass down there? 
Why, shucks, partner, I'd say you'd been chewing some loco weed. And if I could prove it? Nest answered after a moment's pause. Why, then I guess I'd be loco. Han Stark thought it was going to be easy. Mr. Nest, it is a well-known fact that no one can walk in mid-air. Is that not true? Nest took a deep drag on his cigarette and blew the smoke out of his nostrils. Sure. Then if I were to walk out above your pass, you'd have to admit there is no pass. Reckon so. Han Stark began to walk in the direction of Nest's cliff. Nest jumped to his feet and grabbed the official psychiatrist by the arm. What are you trying to do? Nest said angrily. Kill yourself? Han Stark shook free of his grasp. Mr. Nest, I'm not going to kill myself. I'm merely going to walk in that direction. He pointed to where the cliff was supposed to be. To you it will look as if I were walking in midair. Nest dropped his hands to his sides. Shucks, I don't care if you kill yourself. It's just that it's liable to make the cattle nervous. Han Stark gave him a cold glare and began to walk. He took three paces and stopped. You see, Mr. Nest, there is no cliff. Nest looked at him and laughed. You just take one more step and you'll find there is a cliff. Han Stark took another step, a long one. His face bore a surprised look as he disappeared beneath the grass. His screams could be heard for a moment before he landed on the rocks below. Nest walked to the edge of the cliff and looked down at the mangled body. He took off his hat in respect. Little feller had a lot of guts. Then he added, Poor little feller. He put his hat back on and looked down at the entrance to the valley. A horse and rider appeared from behind several rocks. Dirty Dan, Nest exclaimed. He reached down and picked up his rifle. End of section 17《Section 18 of 20 Short Science Fiction Stories by Various Authors》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Smiler by Albert Hernhunter Have you ever written science fiction? Have your stories been rejected? Herein may lie the reason. Your name? Cole, Martin Cole. Your profession? A very important one. I'm a literary agent specializing in science fiction. I sell the work of various authors to magazine and book publishers. The coroner paused to study Cole, to ponder the thin, mirthless smile. The coroner said, Mr. Cole, this inquest has been called to look into the death of one Sanford Smith, who was found near your home with a gun in his hand and a bullet in his brain. The theory of suicide has been... Rather hard to rationalize? The coroner blinked. You could put it that way. I would put it even stronger. The theory is obviously ridiculous. It was a weak cover-up. The best I could do under the circumstances. You are saying that you killed Sanford Smith? Of course. The coroner glanced at his six-man jury, at the two police officers, at the scattering of spectators. They all seemed stunned. Even the reporter sent to cover the hearing made no move toward the telephone. The coroner could think of only the obvious question. Why did you kill him? He was dangerous to us. Whom do you mean by us? We Martians, who plan to take over your world. The coroner was disappointed. A lunatic. But a lunatic can murder. Best to proceed, the coroner thought. I was not aware that we have Martians to contend with. If I'd had the right weapon to use on Smith, you wouldn't be aware of it now. We still exercise caution. The coroner felt a certain pity. Why did you kill Smith? We Martians have found science fiction writers to be our greatest danger. Through the medium of imaginative fiction, such writers have more than once revealed our plans. If the public suddenly realized that... The coroner broke in. You killed Smith because he revealed something in his writings? Yes. He refused to take my word that it was unsaleable. He threatened to submit it direct. It was vital material. But there are many other such writers. You can't control. We control 90% of the output. 
we have concentrated on the field and all of the science fiction agencies are in our hands. This control was imperative. I see. The coroner spoke in the gentle tones one uses with the insane. Any writing dangerous to your cause is deleted or changed by the agents. Not exactly. The agent usually persuades the writer to make any such changes, as the agent is considered an authority on what will or will not sell. The writers always agree? Not always. If stubbornness is encountered, the agent merely shelves the manuscripts and tells the writer it has been repeatedly rejected. The coroner glanced at the two policemen. Both were obviously puzzled. They returned the coroner's look, apparently ready to move on his order. The thin, mirthless smile was still on Cole's lips. Maniacal violence could lie just behind it. Possibly Cole was armed. Better to play for time. Try to quiet the madness within. The coroner continued speaking. You Martians have infiltrated other fields also? Oh, yes. We are in government, industry, education. We are everywhere. We have, of course, concentrated mainly upon the ranks of labor and in the masses of ordinary, everyday people. It is from these sources that we will draw our shock troops when the time comes. That time will be... Soon, very soon. The coroner could not forbear a smile. You find the science fiction writers more dangerous than the true scientists? Oh, yes. The scientific mind tends to reject anything science disproves. There was now a mocking edge to Cole's voice. Science can easily prove we do not exist. But the science fiction writer? The danger from the imaginative mind cannot be overestimated. The coroner knew he must soon order the officers to lay hands upon this madman. He regretted his own lack of experience with such situations. He tried to put a soothing, confidential note into his voice. You said a moment ago that if you'd had the right kind of weapon to use on Smith. Cole reached into his pocket and brought out what appeared to be a fountain pen. This, it kills instantly and leaves no mark whatever. Heart failure is invariably stated as the cause of death. The coroner felt better. Obviously, Cole was not armed. As the coroner raised a hand to signal the officers, Cole said, You understand, of course, that I cannot let you live. Take this man into custody. The police officers did not move. The coroner turned on them sharply. They were smiling. Cole pointed the fountain pen. The coroner felt a sharp chill on his flesh. He looked at the injury, at the newspaper man, the spectators. They were all smiling, cold, thin, terrible smiles. A short time later, the newspaper man phoned in his story. The afternoon editions carried it. Coroner Bell dies of heart attack. Shortly after this morning's inquest, which resulted in a jury verdict of suicide in the case of Sanford Smith, Coroner James Bell dropped dead of heart failure in the hearing room of the county building. Mr. Bell leaves a wife and... End of section 18section 19 of 20 short science fiction stories by various authors this librivox recording is in the public domain the day of the dog by anderson horn they came home from a strange journey and heroes they might have been a little dog and a man carol stared glumly at the ship to shore transmitter I hate being out here in the middle of the Caribbean with no radio communication. Can't you fix it? This is a year for sunspots, and transmission usually gets impossible around dusk, Bill explained. It will be all right in the morning. If you want to listen to the radio, you can use the portable radio directional finder. That always works. I want to catch the five o'clock news and hear the latest on our satellite, Carol replied. She went to the RDF and switched it on to the standard broadcast channel. Anyhow, I'd feel better if we could put out a signal. The way we're limping along with the water in our gas is no fun. It will take us 20 hours to get back to Nassau the way we're losing RPMs. 
Bill Anderson looked at his young, pretty wife and smiled. You're behaving like a tenderfoot. We have plenty of gas, a good boat, and perfect weather. Tomorrow morning I'll clean out our carburetors and we'll pick up speed. Meantime, we're about to enter one of the prettiest harbors in the Bahamas. Throw over anchor. The RDF ground him out. The world is anxiously awaiting the return of the chamber from the world's first manned satellite launched by the United States ten days ago. The world also awaits the answers to two questions. Is there any chance that Robert Joy, the volunteer scientist who went up in the satellite, is still living? There seems to be little hope for his survival since radio communication from him stopped three days ago. Timing mechanism for the ejection of joy are set for tonight. And that's the second question. Will the satellite, still in its orbit, eject the chamber containing joy? Will it eject the chamber as scheduled, and will the chamber arrive at Earth at the designated place? There are so many ifs to this project which is shrouded in secrecy. The President himself has assured us of a free flow of news once the chamber has been recovered and this station will be standing by to bring you a full report. Carol switched the radio off. Do you think he's still alive? She suppressed a shudder. God, think of a human being up there in that thing. Well, the dog lived for several days. It was just a question of getting it back, which the Russians couldn't do. I don't know about Joy. He sounded real cheerful and healthy until his broadcast stopped. Bill peered into the fading twilight. Come on now, let's put our minds to getting the hook over. They concentrated on the tricky entrance to the lee side of Little Harbor Key. It meant finding and passing a treacherous coral head north of the joining frozen key. Little Harbor Key was midway in the chain of the Berry Islands, which stretched to the north like beads in a necklace. There's the cove, called Carol. About a mile of coastline ahead was the small native settlement. Once the center of a thriving sponge industry, the island was now practically deserted. A handful of cottages, a pile of conch shells on the beach, and two fishing smacks gave evidence of a remaining, though sparse, population. Dusk was rapidly approaching, and Carol strained her eyes against the failing light. Bill heard her call his name and saw her pointing, not ahead to their anchorage, but amidships and toward the sky. He turned his eyes to where she was indicating and saw a dullish object in the sky, some thousand feet up. The object seemed to be falling leisurely towards Earth. "'What in the world is that?' asked Bill. "'It's not a bird, that's for sure.' The object seemed to be parachuting, not free-falling. The breezes were blowing it towards the island." Before they could study it further, it was lost in the lowering dusk and darkness of the shoreline. Looks like a ball on a parachute, Bill finally said. However, the business at hand was to make secure the seven seas, and together they spent the next quarter hour anchoring. After setting the hook securely, Carol and Bill donned swimsuits, dove overboard and swam lazily the three hundred yards into shore. Let's try to find that thing we saw. It shouldn't be too far from here, said Carol, the moment they hit the beach. They climbed inland on the rocky island. Little green lizards scooted underfoot and vines scratched at their ankles. Bill was leading when suddenly he called. Carol, I see something up ahead. There's something lying on the ground. He hurried toward what he had seen. The dying sun reflected on a luminescent bolt of cloth somewhat like a spun aluminum fabric. Thin wires were entangling in it, and about ten feet away lay three fragments of what appeared to have been a dull metal box. Carol knelt at the closest piece, evidently a corner of the box. It was lined with wiring and tubes. It looks like electronic equipment, decided Carol, peering intently at the strange piece. Bill had approached the second and largest fragment, he carefully turned it over. It was filled with black and yellow fur. Oh, no, he cried, knowing in a flash, yet denying it in his mind at the same time. 
Stunned, he stared at the perky ears, the dull staring and unseeing eyes, the leather thongs that held the head and body of a dog to the metal encasement. Carol saw it the next instant. "'It's some horrible joke,' she gasped. "'It couldn't be the second Russian satellite. It couldn't be Mutnik. "'My God, no, it couldn't be.' Bill kept staring, his thoughts racing. There were rumors of an ejection chamber for Mutnik, but they had been denied by the Russians. But suppose the Russians had planned an ejection chamber for the dog Laika when they launched the satellite and had only denied it after they thought it had failed. But if it had worked, why had it taken so long to find its way to Earth? The satellite itself was supposed to have disintegrated months ago. Damn, thought Bill. I wish I were a scientist right now instead of a know-nothing artist. He touched the dog with his toe. It was perfectly preserved, as though it had died just a few hours before. It was rigid, but it had not started to decompose. Carol, are we crazy? Is this some dream, or do you believe we are looking at the ejection chamber of the Russian satellite? He asked, doubting even what he was saying. I don't know. Carol was wide-eyed. But what shall we do now? We'd better contact the authorities immediately. Bill tried to keep reason from overcoming his disbelief of their discovery. But how, Carol? Our radio transmitter isn't working. It won't till morning. And there's certainly no other way to communicate with anyone. We can't even take the boat anywhere with the speed we're making. We'll have to wait till morning. What shall we do with the dog? asked Carol. Do you think we ought to bury it? Lord, no, Carol. The body of the dog will be extremely valuable to science. We've got to get someone here as quickly as possible. Bill was trying to steady his nerves. Let's go back and try to raise someone on the radio. Let's try again. It may work, called Carol, running in the direction of the boat. Bill followed her. They stumbled on the craggy rocks and exposed sea grape roots, but together in the darkness they struck out for the boat. Bill was first on board and went directly to the ship to shore radio. Try the Nassau Marine operator first, Carol panted as she clambered aboard. He's a lot closer to us than Miami. As the receiver warmed up, static filled the cabin. Bill depressed the transmitting button. This is Yacht 7 Seas calling the Nassau Marine operator, he called into the phone. Only static answered. Bill! Carol said in sudden inspiration. Give a mayday. Try every channel with a mayday. If anyone picks up a mayday call, you'll get emergency action. Mayday, mayday. This is the yacht Seven Seas. Come in, anyone. Bill called urgently into the mouthpiece. He switched to the Coast Guard channel, then to the Miami Marine Operators channel. Only static filled the cabin. No welcome voice acknowledged their distress call. Bill flipped the switch desperately to the two ship-to-ship -ship channels. Mayday, come in any boat. Still static. Nothing but static. It was night, a night without a moon. The island loomed dark against the black waters. The dark was relieved only by a small fire burning at the native settlement a half-mile down the coast, and the cabin lights of the seven seas. "'What will we do now?' Carol tried to sound unconcerned, but her voice sounded thin and wavering. "'I don't know what we can do, except wait until daybreak. "'I'm sure we can get a signal out then,' Bill replied, calmly as he could. He hoped she wouldn't hear the pounding of his heart. "'What about the dog?' she asked. "'Will it be all right there? Should we bring it aboard? "'We better leave everything untouched.' Our best bet is to get some sleep and place our call as soon as day breaks. Neither of them could eat much supper, and after putting the dishes away, they made up their bunks and climbed in. After a very few minutes, Bill handed a lighted cigarette across the narrow chasm between the bunks. I can't sleep. My head is spinning. Do you really believe that's what we found? Carol's voice sounded small. Yes, I do. I believe we've found the Russian ejection unit, complete with a dog, Laika, and instrumentation. They lay quietly, 
the glow of two cigarettes occasionally reflecting on the bulkhead. Bill finally arose. I can't think of another thing but what's sitting out there on Little Harbor Key. He walked up to the main cabin and switched on the RDF. For a few minutes there was music, and then... Flash! The United States government has just officially released the news that at 10.09 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the U.S. satellite ejection chamber was successfully returned to Earth at the designated location. This was some six hours earlier than expected. The chamber, into which Robert Joy voluntarily had himself strapped, has landed at an undisclosed site and is being raced under heavy guard to the Walter Reed Hospital at Washington, D.C., there is no hope that Joy is still living. Word has just been released by Dr. James R. Killian that instruments measuring Joy's pulse rate indicated three days ago that all Joy's bodily processes ceased to function at that time. We repeat, all hope of the survival of Robert Joy is now abandoned as the result of scientific data just released by Dr. Killian. The satellite is being brought intact to Walter Reed Hospital, and leading physiologists and scientists are racing to the scene to be on hand for the opening of the unit scheduled for 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. Further reports will be given as received. This station will remain on the air all night. Stay tuned for further developments. We repeat, the U.S. satellite's ejection chamber, containing the first human being ever to go into space, has been successfully returned to Earth as predicted, though all hope has been abandoned for the survival of Robert Joy, the man in the moon. The chamber will be open for scientific study tomorrow morning. Stay tuned for further news. Bill turned down the music that ensued and returned to his bunk. You heard that, Carol? He knew she wasn't asleep. Yes, and it makes this whole thing that we've found seem more plausible. I've been lying here trying to make myself believe it's some sort of dream, but it isn't. If we could only... Carol's voice faded softly into the night. There was absolutely nothing they could do. Nothing but lie there and smoke and pretend to sleep. They didn't talk much, and keenly felt the terrible frustration of their enforced silence on the ship to shore. They heard several more news reports and several analyses of the news but nothing new was added throughout the night. The radio only reiterated that the ejection unit had been recovered, that hope had faded for Joy's survival, and that the chamber was to be opened in the morning as soon as scientists had convened in Washington. Dawn, long in coming, broke about 4.30. With the lifting dark, the sunspots which interfered with the radio reception miraculously lifted also. Bill and Carol sat next to the ship to shore and turned it on. This time they heard the reassuring hum of the transmitter, not drowned out by the awful static of the night before. Bill switched to the Coast Guard channel. Mayday, mayday, this is Seven Seas calling the United States Coast Guard. Come in, please. And a voice, almost miraculously answered, This is the U.S. Coast Guard. Come in, Seven Seas. What is your position? Come in, Seven Seas. This is the yacht, Seven Seas, back to the Coast Guard. We are located at the Berry Islands at Little Harbor Key. We want to report the discovery of what we believe to be the second Russian satellite. This is the Coast Guard to the Seven Seas. Do we read you correctly? Are you reporting discovery of the Russian satellite? Please clarify. Over. A stern voice crackled through the speaker. Last evening on entering the harbor here we saw an object fall to the ground. On inspection it was a metal box which was broken apart on impact. In it are electronic equipment and the body of a small dog. Over. Bill tried to be calm and succinct. Coast Guard to Seven Seas. Is your boat in distress? Over. No, no. Did you read me about the Russian satellite? Asked Bill, impatience in his voice. Will you state your name and address? Will you state the master's full name and the call letters and registration of your craft? Over, crackled the voice from the speaker. Oh, my Lord, we're not going to have red tape at a time like this, are we? Carol asked exasperatedly. This is Bill Anderson of Fort Lauderdale, owner and skipper. 
Our call letters are William George, 3176, Coast Guard Registration Number 23546-5483. What are your instructions regarding dog satellite? Please stand by. Bill and Carol stared at each other while the voice on the radio was silent. This is the United States Coast Guard calling the yacht Seven Seas. Seven Seas standing by. We wish to remind you that it is illegal and punishable by a fine or imprisonment to issue false reports to the Coast Guard. We are investigating your report and wish you to stand by. Investigating our report? Bill fairly shouted into the phone. Good God, man! The thing to investigate is here, lying in three pieces on the middle of Little Harbor Key. This is no joke. Despite the emotion in Bill's voice, the answer came back routine and cold. Please stand by. We will call you. Do not, we repeat, do not make further contact anywhere. Please stand by. Coast Guard standing by with seven C's. Seven C's standing by, shouted Bill, almost apoplectic his face reddening in anger. Now what? It looks like they're going to take their time in believing us. At least until they find out who we are and if we're really here, said Carol. Bill paced the deck in frustration. Suddenly he decided, Carol, you stick with the radio. I'm going ashore again and take another look at our mutnik. It seems so incredible I'm not even sure of what I saw last night. Once they believe us, they'll want to know as much about it as we can tell them. Bill hurriedly put on his swimsuit and heard Carol shout as he dove overboard. Hurry back, Bill. I don't like you leaving me here alone. Bill swam with shore-even strokes to the shore where they had gone last night. The water felt cool. It soothed his nerves which jangled in the excitement of the discovery and in the anger of the disbelieving authorities. He reached shallow water and waded towards the shore. Suddenly he stopped dead, his ankles in five inches of water. His eyes stared ahead in disbelief. His brain was numbed. Only his eyes were alive, staring, wide in horror. Finally his brain pieced together the image that his vision sent to it. Pieced it together but made no comprehension of it. His brain told him that there was a blanket of fur laying unevenly twenty feet back from the shoreline. A blanket of yellow and black fur, covering the earth, covering mangrove roots, fitted neatly around the bent palm tree trunks, lying over the rocks that had cut his feet last night, smothering, suffocating, hugging the earth. Bill shut his eyes, and still the vision kept shooting to his brain. All yellow and black and fuzzy, with trees or tall mangrove bush or sea grapevine sticking up here and there. He opened his eyes and wanted to run, for the scene was still there. It hadn't disappeared as a nightmare disappears when you wake up. Thick yellow and black fur lay on the ground like dirty snow, covering everything low, hugging the base of taller things. Run, his mind told him, yet he stood rooted to the spot, staring at the carpet of fur near him. It was only ten feet away. Ten feet? His every muscle jumped. The lock that had held his muscles and brain in a tight vise gave loose and a flood of realization hit him. It's moving, he realized in horror. It's growing. As he watched, slowly, slowly, as the petals of a morning glory unfold before the eye, the yellow and black fur carpet stretched itself in ever-increasing perimeter saw it approach a rock near the beach. The mind, when confronted with a huge shock, somehow concentrates itself on a small detail. Perhaps it tries to absorb itself in a small thing, because the whole thing is too great to comprehend all at once. So with Bill's mind. He saw the yellow and black fur grow toward the rock. It seemed to ooze around it, and then up and over the top of it. Bill saw when it reached the top of the rock, that it dropped a spiny tendril into the ground. Like a root, the tendril buried itself into the earth below the jutting rock, and slowly the rock was covered with the growing fur. Bill's thoughts sped ahead of his reason. The dog, the dog, growing like a plant. Its hide covering the ground, putting out roots, suffocating everything, smothering everything, 
growing, growing. With almost superhuman effort, he turned his back on the awful sight and swam desperately out to the seven seas. "'Bill, what's happened?' cried Carol, when she saw his white and terrified face. "'Carol, the dog! It must have had some cosmic reaction to its cellular structure, some cancerous reaction. When the chamber broke open and the cells were exposed to our atmosphere again, it started some action, started to grow, doesn't stop growing. It's horrible!' Bill's words were disjointed and hysterical. Carol stared at him. "'Bill, what are you saying?' Bill pointed mutely to the shore. Carol rushed to the cockpit. She stared at the island. She ran back to the cabin where Bill was sitting, holding his head in his hands. She grabbed the binoculars from the bookshelf and turned them to the island. Bill, it's... Oh, no! The whole island looks as though it's covered with... Fur! She screamed. Bill grabbed the binoculars and ranged the island with them. A quarter of a mile down he could see small figures in the water, floundering around, climbing aboard the two fishing smacks. All around, the black and yellow mounds of fur carpeted the pretty green island with a soft rug of yellow and black. "'Get the Coast Guard, Carol!' "'They called back while you were gone. They're sending a plane over immediately.' "'Call them, Carol!' Bill shouted at her. "'Don't you realize what this could mean?' Don't you realize that something, only God knows what, has happened to the cellular structure of this animal, has turned it into a voracious plant-like thing that seems to grow and grow once it hits our atmosphere? Don't you realize that today they're going to open that satellite, that other one in Washington? Suppose this is what happens when living tissue is exposed to cosmic rays or whatever's up there. Don't you see what could happen? Bill was hoarse from fright and shouting. Smother everything! Grow and grow and smother! Carol was at the ship to shore. What time is it, Carol? I don't know. Five-thirty, I guess. They plan to open the ejection chamber at six. We've got to tell them what happened here before they open it. Hurry with the damned Coast Guard! Mayday! Mayday! Coast Guard, come in! This is the Seven Seas. Come in and hurry! Coast Guard to the Seven Seas, come in. Bill grabbed the phone. Listen carefully, he said in a quiet, determined voice. This is God's own truth. I repeat, this is God's own truth. The remains of the dog we discovered last night have started to grow. It's growing as we look at it. It has covered the entire island as far as we can see with fur. Stinking yellow and black fur. We've got to get word to Washington before they open up the satellite. The same thing could happen there. Do you understand? I must get in touch with Washington immediately. There was no mistaking the urgency and near panic in Bill's voice. The Coast Guard returned with, We understand you, Seven Seas. We will clear a line directly to Dr. Killian in Washington. Stand by. With his hand shaking, Bill turned on the standard broadcast band of the portable RDF. A voice cut in. Latest reports from Walter Reed General Hospital where the first human man satellite ejection chamber has just been opened. All leading physiologists and physicists were assembled at the hospital by midnight last night and plans to open the ejection chamber at 6 a.m. this morning were moved up. The chamber was opened at 4 a.m. Eastern Standard Time today. Our first report confirmed that volunteer moon traveler, the man in the moon, Robert Joy, was no longer alive. Hope had been abandoned for him some eighty hours previous, when recording instruments on his body processes indicated no reactions. Of scientific curiosity is the fact that though dead for more than three days, his body is in a perfect state of preservation. Flash, we interrupt this special newscast for a late bulletin. The body of Robert Joy has begun to shoot out unexplained appendages, like rapidly growing cancerous growths. His integument appears to be enlarging, growing away from his body. Hello, Seven Seas, broke in the ship to shore. We are still trying to locate Dr. Killian. End of Section 19 
Section 20 of Short Science Fiction Stories by Various Authors. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Shining Cow by Alex James. This is not a story about sinister aliens from outer space. This is simply the story of what happened to poor Junius when she found herself much too close to a flying saucer, long enough so she could be analyzed and long enough to cause some strange happenings on that farm. Robbie whined and acted like his eyes were burning, as if he'd gotten dust or something even stranger into them. Jack Stewart stared deeply into the bottom of his cracked coffee cup as his wife began to gather the breakfast dishes. Mrs. Stewart was a huge, methodical woman, seasoned to the drudgery of a farm wife. Quite methodically, she'd arise every morning at 4 a.m., with her husband and each would do their respective chores until long after the sun had set on their forty-acre farm. "'You've just got to find Junius today, Zack,' Mrs. Stewart spoke worriedly. "'Lord only knows her condition, not being milked since yesterday.' "'Yeah, I know, Ma,' Zack said wearily as he rose from the table. "'I'll search for her again in the north woods, but if she ain't there this time, I give up.' A dog suddenly howled outside. There was a brief instant when neither moved. Then Zack suddenly exclaimed, "'It's Robbie!' and dashed outside. In the light from the open doorway, Zack saw the dog creeping along on his haunches, howling and whining, and scratching frantically at his tear-streaming eyes. A skunk finally got you, eh, boy? Zack spoke sympathetically as the dog, fawning, came closer. "'Stay away, Robbie. Stay away now,' he ordered the dog. Robbie whined and scratched again, furiously. Zack sniffed cautiously, expecting any moment the pungent smell of skunk fluid to hit his nostrils. He sensed nothing but the clean, fresh smell of the morning air, so he leaned closer. Within a foot of Robbie, he sniffed again. Nothing. He realized it wasn't a skunk that caused Robbie's eyes to burn. He knelt down and took the dog's head tenderly in his rough calloused hands and examined his eyes. They were bloodshot and watery. He took some water from the well and dashed it into the dog's eyes as Robbie struggled. "'Hold still, boy. I'm trying to help you,' Zack soothed. He took out a blue work bandana and wiped tenderly around Robbie's eyes. "'What did it, boy? How did it happen?' Zack asked. Robbie merely whined. "'What's wrong with him?' Mrs. Stewart, broom in hand, asked from the doorway. "'Don't rightly know,' Zack patted the dog. "'Acts like he's got something in his eyes. "'Skunk?' "'Nah,' Zack shook his head. "'He don't smell. Something else. "'Cat?' "'No scratches either. "'He acts like they're burning him, "'like he got dust or something in him. "'We'll take him out to the barn, "'and you better get after Junius.' "'Yeah, Ma. Come on, Robbie.' He led Robbie to the barn and made him lie on a bed of hay in one of the stalls, then returned to the kitchen for his lantern. He put on his thick denim jacket and work cap and turned to his wife. If she ain't in the woods, I'll come back and get the truck and drive over to the lemurs and see if he's seen her. He left the kitchen and shone the lantern around the farmyard to get his bearings, then headed for the north end of his farm. He could see the faint glimmer of dawn in the east more pronounced in the northeast, and even more so due north. He rubbed his eyes. A much brighter glow outlined the treetops in the north woods that made the dawn on the eastern horizon look like a dirty gray streak. His first thought was a fire, but there was no smoke, no flame. Zack walked dazedly toward the woods, his eyes glued to the light above the trees. Soon he was in the woods, and he could see the brightness extended down through the trees from the sky, on the other side of the woods. He approached cautiously as the light grew brighter, and came to the clearing where it was most intense. A thick bush obstructed his view, and Zack moved it aside, then uttered a hoarse gasp, as he clutched at his eyes. For a moment he felt he was dreaming. He squinted between the slits of his fingers. The glow was still piercing, but he could see the brightly lit Junius radiating blue-white light, nibbling at the sparse grass in the clearing. Zack stood transfixed, his eyes widening behind his fingers. 
He felt the tears and the burning sensation, and squinted tightly, turning his head from the unbelievable scene. Zack didn't remember his return to the farmhouse, or incoherently trying to explain to his wife the scene he had witnessed. A stiff jolt of elderberry wine drove off the jitters, and reasoning returned. His wife sat patiently, eyeing him oddly, as Zack muttered over and over again, "'It's unbelievable! It's unbelievable!' Mrs. Stewart rose. "'I'm going out and see for myself. And, Zack, if you're lying to me—' Zack jumped from the chair, barring her way. "'Believe me, Ma, it's true. Don't go out there. It might be too much for you.' "'It's the craziest thing I've ever heard,' Mrs. Stewart scoffed. "'A cow that shines like the sun. "'Look, Ma, will you just come with me as fur as the pasture? "'You can see the glow from there, and maybe that might convince you. "'Yes, yes, I will.' "'Mrs. Stewart jerked off her apron. "'I declare, Zack, I think these chores are getting the best of you.' "'They walked to the pasture, their eyes on the treetops of the north woods. "'A faint glow began to appear.' See? See? Jack pointed, laughing crazily. Let's get closer. Looks like a fire, Mrs. Stewart said. Ain't no fire. Zack's tone was angry. It's Junius, and she's all lit up like a Christmas tree. Zack, now you stop that kind of crazy talk. There's a reason behind everything, and I'm sure there's one for this. There's a reason, Ma. Junius. She got the whole clearing lit up like a noonday sun. Lord only knows how she got that way, but she's shining out there like a great big light bulb, only brighter. Mrs. Stewart quickened her pace toward the clearing. I'm going to see for myself, she said determinedly, and put an end to this foolish nonsense. All right, Ma, Zack spoke resignedly, if your mind's set. But I'm warning you, you better squint your eyes tight. She's too bright to look at. Poor Robbie must have got too good a look at her. Mrs. Stewart approached the clearing ahead of her husband and moved the same bush aside that had obstructed her husband's view. Her gaze caught the brightly radiating figure of Junius, and Mrs. Stewart screamed, clasping her face with her hands. Zack had his head turned, but he groped for his wife, grasped her arm, and led her from the clearing. "'It's too crazy to believe, Zack,' she whispered in awe. What are we going to do? What has happened to poor Junius? I don't know what happened to her, Zack answered, but I know what I'm going to do about it. I'm going to call the university and get them scientist fellas down here. You suppose they can get close enough to milk the poor thing? Mrs. Stewart clasped her hands in frustration. She's probably in misery. Zack shook his head. Ain't no telling what they're liable to do after they've seen her. Most likely they'll want to ship her to the university to examine her and see how she got that way. Why don't we call the veterinarian? Mrs. Stewart asked. It might be some kind of new disease. Ain't no disease, Ma. It's something nobody in the world has ever seen or heard of before. I just hope I can convince them university fellows to come down here. Don't you think you better tie Junius so she won't stray? Better wait and see what them scientists say. "'Besides, if she strays, all we gotta do is follow the light.' Zack did the most important chores, and at 8 a.m. on the dot he called the university. The operator at the switchboard answered sleepily. "'Good morning, State University.' "'Morning, ma'am. I'd like to talk to one of them scientist fellows. "'To whom in particular do you wish to speak? "'Any of them that ain't busy. I got something important to tell them.' If I knew what it was about, the operator was becoming irritated, I'd connect you with the right party. Zack hesitated, reluctant to give his startling news to a mere operator. Instead, he hedged. Well, who would have charge of things that lit up? Oh, you want the electrical engineering lab. Just a moment, sir. There was a series of clicks and buzzes in the earpiece, then Zack heard a man's deep voice. Hello? Hello, Zack replied. This the electrical engineering lab? Yes, sir, that's right. Well, my name is Zack Stewart, and I own a 40-acre farm on the Canal Road, just outside of Smithville. I'm Professor Donnell. Can I help you? Yeah. Zack took a deep breath, then began. 
My cow Junius was missing since yesterday morning, and this morning, when I went out to search for her again, I found her. Mr. Stewart, Professor Donnell's voice was impatient. I'm a very busy man with a heavy class schedule. Why in the world would I care if you found your cow or not? You'd care if you knew how I found her. All right, Mr. Stewart. How did you find your cow? With some new kind of radar? No, sir. I found her by following the bright light in the north wood, and when I got there, there was Junius lit up like a neon sign. Mr. Stewart, are you drunk? I knew you wouldn't believe me. All I can say is, come see for... Zack heard a sudden click, then an immediate buzzing. Professor Donnell had hung up. He had no sooner replaced the phone when there was a pounding on the door. He opened it and saw six state troopers and four important-looking gentlemen in civilian dress. A trooper who looked as though he might be in charge spoke to Zack. "'Sir, we don't want you or your wife to get panicky, but we have reason to believe that something strange is going on in your woods. These men are from the Atomic Research Laboratory at the University.' and they are convinced that a flying saucer has landed out there. It ain't no flying saucer, Zack spoke wearily. It isn't? One of the gentlemen asked, disappointed. Then what is it? It's Junius, my cow. You're what? The state trooper exclaimed incredulously. Are you nuts? Angrily, Zack jerked his thumb in the direction of the north woods. Just go out there and see for yourself, and then tell me I'm nuts. They hurriedly left the house, looking back skeptically at Zack. Zack and his wife stood in the doorway, watching them till they were out of sight in the woods. You watch him come bustling back here in a minute, Ma. In a few moments they saw the men scrambling out of the woods, rushing madly for the house, holding their eyes. Now I don't have to convince anybody, Zack smirked. By the time they reached the porch, they were all talking excitedly and rubbing their eyes. The state trooper in charge pulled Zack aside. Mister, he said ominously, what the hell happened to that cow? I don't know, Zack spoke with sarcasm, just the way I found her. The important-looking civilian bustled past the patrolman and confronted Zack. I'd like to use your phone. His hands moved nervously. Where is it? Zack showed him and the man rushed to it and hastily dialed a number. This is Professor Jonathan Sims, nuclear physicist at State University. Put me through immediately to the governor. It's very important. There was a slight pause as Sims drummed impatiently on the phone. Hello? Hello, Governor. Professor Sims. I'd like a contingent of National Guardsmen around the farm of Zack Stewart on the Old Canal Road. A most astounding thing has happened out here. For the welfare of the public, I urgently request this farm be placed under tight security check at once and the federal government notified immediately. Hey now, wait a minute, mister, Zack protested. Sims motioned him into silence, his ear glued to the phone. Sir, he hesitated, glancing at the group sideways. You won't believe this until you see it. But we have positive proof a saucer has landed here. Mr. Stewart's cow is radiating intense blue and white light, the kind that has been associated with the glow of flying saucers. Sims paused, listening to the governor. Zack saw him fidget and stick a forefinger in his collar. Honestly, sir, I'm not drunk. The cow is radiating light. See, Zack grinned at him. Now you know how I felt. Sims ignored him, concentrating on the phone. Yes, sir, there is a state trooper here. He turned to the one in charge. He wants to speak to you. The trooper took the receiver. Hello, Governor. Sergeant Les Johnson of the Highway Patrol. Pause. That's right, sir. There's a number of people here who can swear to it. Yes, sir. This time the trooper fidgeted. I seen it, too. Blue-white light. Yes, sir. No, sir, we are not having a drinking party. The light was reported by the pilot of Continental Airways early this morning, and we investigated. Yes, sir. He held the receiver toward Sims. He wants to talk to you again. The governor was finally convinced something indeed strange was happening at the Stewart place, but being a solid citizen and faithful servant of the people who elected him, 
he couldn't believe the fantastic story the professor and the trooper told him. He decided to see for himself and rang for his chauffeur after his telephone conversation with Professor Sims. Meanwhile, Mrs. Stewart turned to Sims. Will you please tell us if Junius can be milked? I really don't know yet, Mrs. Stewart. I'll have to investigate the area for harmful radioactivity first. Then I'll have to check the cow herself. Pardon me. He turned to the phone again. Trying to keep his voice and emotion under control, Professor Sims called his laboratory at the university and ordered, among other technical equipment, a Geiger counter, a gamma ray detector, a portable lead shield, body and temperature thermometers, a portable X-ray machine, and a dozen pairs of smoke glasses. The equipment arrived within the hour, and Professor Sims distributed it among his assistants with his instructions. It was understood that he alone would approach Junius, wearing his smoke glasses and carrying the protective lead shield, to make the initial test. If his test proved that Junius could be safely approached, he would go back for the others. "'You look like one of them flying saucer fellows yourself,' Zack laughed, seeing Professor Sims donned in the lead shield in the dark glasses. Sims waved at the crowd in the farmyard and walked awkwardly toward the glow in the north wood, less pronounced now in the daylight. They watched until his retreating figure disappeared into the woods, and they were still watching the spot for what seemed a long time afterward. One of the assistants fidgeted and looked at his watch. He's been in there twenty minutes. Wonder what he's doing. I hope he's milking her, Mrs. Stewart said hopefully. Zack chuckled as a thought struck him. What's so funny, Zack? his wife asked. Junius, Zack's chuckle bubbled into laughter, will be the first cow to give radiated milk. Finally, after another fifteen minutes, they saw Professor Sims emerge from the woods. As he came across the pasture, they could see that his smoke glasses were propped above his eyebrows, and he was concentrating on a small notebook in his hand, shaking his head from time to time. When he finally joined the waiting group, he was flooded with questions. He gestured them into silence. Please, I cannot answer any questions as yet until I have consulted with my assistants. Sergeant Johnson, will you please have your men guard the clearing while we hold a conference? Is it safe to get that close to her? The trooper asked, unbelieving. I can assure you that it is. There is just a negligible amount of radioactivity present, and no more ultraviolet rays than there are in an average sun lamp. But you must wear your glasses. Turning to his aides, he said, Come, gentlemen, and they followed him into the farmhouse. Can she be milked? Mrs. Stewart wailed after them. What a god-awful situation! Zack muttered, grabbing a pitchfork and heading for the barn. The scientists seated themselves around the big dining-room table and faced Professor Sims. Gentlemen, this is the most amazing thing that ever happened. The cow is glowing out there like a miniature atomic pile, and under the circumstances as we know them, should be deader than a doornail. But there she stands, shining like the morning sun, chewing her cud and just mooing away as if nothing happened. "'What is your theory, Professor?' one of the assistants asked. "'I have one, but it's utterly fantastic,' Sims answered. "'So is that cow out there. Let's hear it. "'Do you remember how much more frequent saucer sightings were reported in this area alone?' Sims asked. "'All the assistants nodded their heads. "'Well,' Sims went on, "'I am of the opinion that a saucer actually landed out there "'and they came across the cow by accident.' They either shot her with some sort of radium ray gun or some luminous substance unknown to us. Why didn't Junius die? One of the assistants asked. Sim shook his head. They wished to examine her. You see, gentlemen, whatever it was, it served a threefold purpose. It made her luminous, immobile, and Sims placed both hands on the table and leaned forward for emphasis, transparent. There was a gasp and exclamations. Transparent? How? I was within a foot of the cow, felt her hide, and through the glasses I could see the skeletal frame, the chest cavity, the heart beating within, the entire intestinal tract, 
much, much more clearly than could be seen by the best X-ray. As if on command, the assistants all rose simultaneously. Sit down, gentlemen. The cow isn't going anywhere. We shall have to face this situation with sound scientific reasoning. There will be a closed van here soon to pick up Junius and haul her to the laboratory where we can examine her more thoroughly. Now my belief is that the saucer took off in haste, with such great haste that they forgot to extinguish poor Junius. I believe they will be back looking for her, therefore we shall have to return her tonight and conceal ourselves around the area and watch. Splendid idea, Professor Sims, one of the assistants exclaimed. Yelling voices in the farmyard caught their attention. They saw Sergeant Johnson through the dining room window, coming across the yard, yelling and pointing to the sky. Sims rushed from the house, met Johnson, grasped him by the shoulders, shaking him. "'What happened, man? What happened?' Sims asked. "'Black light! Black light!' Johnson shouted, pointing skyward. Sims looked up. Nothing but the serene blue of the summer sky, and occasional bird caught his eye. Sims shook him again, more roughly. "'Speak, man! What happened?' Black light flashed down on the cow. "'Blackest light you ever saw!' The group gathered round him in the yard, trying to make sense out of what he said. So engrossed were they with his babblings, that none but Mrs. Stewart was aware of the fact that Junius had entered the farmyard and was eyeing them curiously. "'Junius!' she exclaimed. "Moo!" The crowd looked up to see the ordinary, unlit Junius standing calmly by the gate. "'Hurry and get the milk pail, Zack. Junius is all right now.' Mrs. Stewart yelled happily to her husband, as Professor Sims and his assistants led the hysterical trooper into the house. High over the horizon, a faint, silvery disk was disappearing at fantastic speed to outer space. End of Section 20 End of 20 Short Science Fiction Stories by Various Authors